seeing that we have a quorum. Please stand by for our technical difficulties. <laughs> no, I I know that's pretty good. Try it now. Okay. It works. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is the Bloomington Common Council Organizational Meeting Committee, the whole meeting for Wednesday, January 8th, 2020. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Flaherty? Here. Smith? Here. Piedmont Smith? Here. Scamaluri? Here. Rallo? Here. Volan? Here. Sims? Here. Rosenbarger? Here. Sandberg? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Here's our agenda summation this evening. If you would like an agenda, you may find them beside the clerk. Uh, we have no approval of minutes this evening. We will go to reports uh, from council members first, and then we will have reports from the mayor and city offices, council committees, and then we'll turn it over to the public. If you would like to speak on items not on our agenda, you're welcome to at that time. We will then go to election of officers for the year 2020. We will go to appointments to boards and commissions. And then we have um, three items uh, for second reading and resolutions this evening. Those are resolution 2002 to approve, approve the interlocal agreement between Monroe County, the town of Ellettsville, and the city of Bloomington for the animal shelter operation for the year 2020 and it hasn't received a committee recommendation. Uh, item two is resolution 20-03 to approve the interlocal cooperation agreement between the city of Bloomington and Mer Monroe County, Indiana regarding the building code authority. It likewise has received no committee recommendation. Item three is resolution 20-01 uh, and that is to establish standing committees and abolish other certain committees of the Common Council and that is sponsored by Councilmember Volan, and it hasn't received a committee recommendation. After legislation for second reading and resolutions, we will then go to legislation for first reading. We have two items. The first is Ordinance 20-01 to amend the City of Bloomington zoning maps by rezoning a 3.2 acre property from commercial limited CL to a plan unit development, PUD, and approve a district ordinance and preliminary plan regarding 105 South Pete Ellis Drive, Curry Urban Properties Petitioner. We anticipate a motion to refer that to the Land Use Committee. And then the second item is Ordinance 20-02, which is final approval to issue economic development notes and lend the proceeds for the renovation of affordable housing regarding Walnut Woods 818 East Miller Drive and Reverend, Re Reverend Butler Apartments 1202 West 11th Street Bloomington RAD uh, 1 LP petitioner. Then we've reserved time for additional public comment. 25 minutes is set aside for items not on our agenda. We'll visit council schedule before we adjourn, and then we will immediately reconvene uh, for a committee of the whole um, uh, regarding ordinance 20-02. So with that, we will go to reports from council members, and I will begin on my left with council member Sandberg. We have a lot on our plate this evening, so no report. Council member Rosenberger. No report. Council member Sims. No report. Council member Volan. <clears throat> Happy 2020, welcome to the new decade. Good luck to us all, thank you. Council member Flaherty, do you have a report this evening? No report. Uh, council member Smith, do you have a report? I have no report. Councilmember Piedmont Smith, do you have a report? Yeah, I'll just make a few comments. Um, uh, it'll be a big year uh, for the nation and the world, and for us locally as well. And I want to welcome my new council colleagues and uh, thank them for stepping up to leadership in such difficult times. Um, I would like to just uh, briefly mention um, the. Uh, well, no, I won't. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I look forward to working with the mayor and his administration on several issues in the coming months, um, including the um, convention center and the uh, 
new tax that he has proposed for um, climate action. Uh, a lot of details there to be considered. Um, and also uh, the fate of the 4th Street parking garage, which we know is not going as smoothly as uh, the administration had hoped. And so there are some decisions to be made there. So I look forward to working collaboratively with um, Mayor Hamilton and the administration on those issues. And um, I have said this before, and so I want to say it again as we're starting a new year, um, that I think all uh, individuals in elected leadership and all bodies um, that uh, are to serve the public must uh, first and foremost take into consideration the climate emergency that we are in and um, base all of our decision making on the fact that we are in uncharted waters uh, as far as climate change and we need to make drastic changes in the way that we live and the way that we govern um, on all levels. Uh, including here locally. So that will be uh, guiding my decisions this year, this year and into the future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, Councilmember Skimbalary, do you have a comment? I want to express my thanks to those who participated in my first constituent meeting uh, this past Saturday. We had a rather robust discussion on public transit, uh, the proposed income tax that's coming before us, and environmental issues. Um, so thank you to those who attended. I also want to let folks know that my next constituent meeting, they will be on first Saturdays. So February 1st, 1.30 in the McCloskey Room, which is just down the hall. Uh, and I'll, I let press know about that as well. So you might see it in several places. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I have a brief comment and I'll follow up on Councilmember Piedmont Smith, which um, I think we have a unique opportunity in the coming year, the coming decade to address climate change. Uh, I'm very enthused about the mayor's commitment um, to provide necessary resources, and it will, of course, be a collective effort to do that. Um, but given our current situation, uh, having looked at the uh, United Nations Environmental Program report that came out in late November, uh, you know, the likelihood of, of stabilizing carbon emissions, reducing carbon emissions such that we can uh, not exceed 1.5 degree C by the end of the uh, century is growing remotely dim. And uh, we need to take uh, action. Every community needs to take action. Um, they reckon that we need to uh, essentially have the, the emissions that we currently produce by about half um, by over the next decade in order to keep emissions such that we don't exceed 1.5 degrees C. At the current uh, trajectory, uh, according to the, if we were to follow even the Paris Accord, it would mean a 3.2 degree increase, which is catastrophic for us by the end of the century. Um, so I, I support Mayor Hamilton's uh, effort. Uh, I, I will be supportive of it. I. Uh, I recognize city government produces only about 10% of our emissions, so it's going to take a collaborative effort with Indiana University, with residents of the community, with the business community, local nonprofits, and residents, and so forth. And we also need to be aware of the scale. Uh, mindful, of course, that we, uh, Bloomington has a population of about 80 to 90,000 people, and we add two and a half times that every year, every day to the planet's population. Um, so uh, our effort will be modest, but in terms of the entire effect, but we have a moral imperative to do so. Um, so uh, with that, I will conclude uh, council member comments. We'll go to mayor and city offices, if the mayor and city offices have any reports. Okay, seeing none, we'll go to council committee reports. Are there any? Seeing none, we will go to the public. If the public would like to comment. Please step forward, state your name, and be sure to sign in for the clerk's benefit. Good evening, members of the council. My name is David Keppel, and I'm here tonight as spokesperson for Bloomington Peace Action Coalition with colleagues. Uh, I have had the privilege and joy of witnessing many council meetings 
uh, over the years and in the past months. And I would like to thank all of you for the important work you do, whether this hall is full or it's empty, whether the issue is controversial or non-controversial, but simply important. You work with care, and I thank you for the important work that you do. One function of the Council, not the only one, but a very important one, is to serve as a forum for democracy. In a period when our federal offices have been captured by big money and by uh, gerrymandering, you provide a, an outlet for real democracy. Uh, so all issues that do not get adequately resolved at the federal level can be reconfigured by the work that you do. Tonight, as you know, in the past week, the United States has come very close to a disastrous war with Iran. This council in 2003 had the courage to pass a resolution opposing what turned out to be the disastrous invasion of Iraq. Today, perhaps tensions were somewhat reduced in the immediate sphere with Iran. But one thing that has already happened as a result of the current president's assassination of Major General Qasem Soleimani is that Iran has resumed its nuclear program. We face in coming years a choice, a choice between nuclear anarchy and proliferation and almost surely at some point a disastrous nuclear war. That on the one hand, or really taking seriously the United States' commitment under the Non-Proliferation Treaty in Article 6 to work toward nuclear disarmament. It has to be done carefully. It has to be done methodically. It has to be done in negotiations with other countries. It has to be highly verified. There's been a great deal of work on this, and it can be done in a prudent way. So we hope that this council will take up such a resolution making Bloomington one of the growing number of cities in the United States and around the world, declaring itself in alignment with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which was passed in the United Nations in 2017. We look forward to working with you. We thank you for all that you do, and we hope that you will see the value and importance of making this part of your early agenda. I have copies of the resolution that I will leave with the city clerk. Thank you, Mr. Keppel. Hello, I'm Tommy Allison, and a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And it's a 100-year-old organization still fighting for peace. And uh, this, we support this resolution, and I hope that you will, too. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Atlas. Hi, uh, I'm Greg Alexander. Um, first off, uh, seems to be a mayor report that's missing. They, uh, I'm sure some of you all read the B Square Beacon. Um, the the mayor decided unilaterally to remove the ground floor real uh, commercial on the parking garage on Fourth Street without notifying you guys, but he notified the court. Anyways, that's not what I came to talk about. Um, I spent, last year I was here most meetings, I delivered the same sermon, it, it went like this. Most people that live in most locations in this city, in order to walk to anywhere they actually need to walk to, they're gonna meet a sidewalk that's just straight missing. They're gonna meet a sidewalk that is so chronically under-maintained that is covered in weeds, it's covered in trash, it's covered in, any number of things, construction debris. Um, you'll meet a sidewalk that's been chronically closed for years for construction. And this gives people, well, there's no sidewalks. People are walking in the street, you know? Um, and so I'm kinda, I'm gonna presume to tell you your agenda, hopefully, for this year. If not this year, I would, I would pray at least this, this term of the council is, um, because sidewalks aren't very sexy, you know? Sidewalks are not gonna, on their own, they're not gonna move. Um, 
the, uh, you know, the mode share is not gonna change just because you built sidewalks. But if we don't have sidewalks, we don't have anything. And we simply don't have sidewalks. Anybody that is going to leave their car behind, is going to go from a two-car family to a one-car family, is gonna use sidewalks. Every last one of them is gonna use sidewalks, and they are all gonna have a miserable experience. So what you guys need to do is, first off, sidewalks have to be maintained. Sidewalks have to be maintained. And second off, sidewalks have to be built. The Sidewalk Commission is doing a good job with the absolute pittance that they're given, but most of the work that they do, some of you sit on that, you know this, most of the work that they do is they find excuses not to build sidewalks. That has to end. You have to fund the Sidewalk Committee. We spent $30 million on parking garages last year. We can spend $30 million on sidewalks this year. If we do not spend $30 million on sidewalks, the mayor already has a plan to spend all the TIF fund this year again on parking garages. Again, more parking garages. But we can spend that money on sidewalks, but you will have to be aggressive. And there's a third thing you have to do, and this is gonna be, in some ways, the easiest thing because you don't actually have to do anything. It doesn't have to go in the budget, it can be in resolutions, it can be in questions, but you need to convince staff that you're serious about transportation, about sidewalks in particular, because staff doesn't believe it. Staff, staff has, I've interacted with a lot of staff, I've met a lot of different opinions, but staff, if they do, want to do something for sidewalks, they feel like it's not going to be funded, they're not going to be uh, supported if there's a backlash from drivers, for example, if they take away a parking spot. Um, and a lot of staff feels like it's their job to move cars. It's been their job to move cars for 40 years. For 40 years, we haven't built sidewalks from about 1970 to 1990. We almost didn't build a single sidewalk, even as we built most of the city that we live in. And that needs to change. So when staff comes and doesn't mention sidewalks for a development project, you need to ask them about that. When staff comes and says there are sidewalks in this area and there aren't, I'm not saying people need to be fired, but, but somebody needs to feel like they screwed up, like that's not what their job actually is. And when staff sees like a construction site that, um, I was at a construction site, it was blocked. Um, it wasn't supposed to be blocked. There was supposed to be, it was one of those one time in a hundred where they had said, you guys have to have a diversion, uh, a, a detour for pedestrians. And instead of having a detour, they parked a crane in the detour. And the guy at city, the staff member, that it was his job to make sure that didn't happen. He said, what can I do? All I can do is, is I can issue a stop work order. If he issued a stop work order, they wouldn't put the crane in the sidewalk. You know, but he doesn't feel like that's his job. He feels like if he does that, the, the developer will complain to the mayor, the developer will complain to you guys. You guys need to make him feel the other way around. So, um, you know, that's gonna be a, a petty operation. You're gonna make bogus resolutions if you're going to achieve this that don't do anything except call out a certain project, like the 4th Street Garage. We should not close the sidewalks at, at the bus station for an entire year to rebuild the 4th Street Garage. You should just go ahead and pass that as a resolution. You can do that tonight, you can do that next week, you can do that the week after. It's a resolution, you can just do it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there further public comment? Seeing, oh, please. Hi, I'm Ben Ramsden, and I'm actually going to read a statement so I don't forget anything. It's only my second time here, so I might get a little nervous. But first of all, I want to say hello to the city council members, and thank you for Ms. Piedmont Smith and Mr. Flaherty for coming out to my house on Saturday and walking through the neighborhood on the south side to talk with me and the people in the area about Crawford Apartments, of course. Uh, I believe they may have learned a lot. The main thing I believe they learned is that not one person they met disagreed with me. Not one. I believe they learned that the people there that disagree vehemently with the mayor, Hamilton, and when asked about a politician pitching this is a great, as, as for the city of Bloomington, the, in order to get more funding is a lie and a con. When they were there, they agreed that the reason this is not at Hyde Park or IU is because the people that live there would have put up way more of a fight. They saw needles and needle caps everywhere and even had people who heard what we were talking about excited that someone was actually caring because they can't let their kids outside and had picked up 32 needles themselves recently just so she could walk her dog. They agreed that no one would want this in their area. No one does. So my question is, is when is the board going to stand up to a mayor who is doing what he wants instead of what anyone should be able to see as the will of the people he serves? 4,000 votes of people who most likely were begged to vote doesn't give you the right to go against the people's will, does it? I personally don't believe the mayor is unintelligent, so he has to know that people hate this and will hate it wherever it's built. 
he is not unintelligent, or I'm sorry, uh, then I can only conclude, if he is not unintelligent, then I can only conclude that he is not being sincere when saying how great this is for the city. He even has a person quoted on his web page about how much Crawford has helped him. That person works at the Shalom Center who got all this started. Seems a little shady to me. The mayor also told me after the last meeting that he would talk to me if I wanted, but doesn't answer messages or call. I don't blame him. I wouldn't want to talk to me either if I was him. I would like some kind of response to this this evening. I asked Ms. Piedmont Smith, and Mr. Flaherty, and I'm now asking the board the same thing. Since every person you talked to said the, that this is ruining the area and they would absolutely not want these built anywhere, when are you going to put politics aside and stand up to our mayor going against the people of this city and their wishes? I hope you actually represent the people and not just what you think is right. When I told my father I may run for council, he asked me a question. What would I do if I was on the council and people wanted things done that I didn't agree with? I had to think long and hard because I have strong feelings on some issues. I told him I would have to do what the people wanted because that's my job, whether I agreed or not. I couldn't, if I couldn't do that, I would have to resign my position. I'm going to repeat that not one person down there agrees with the mayor that we talk to, and I talk to people all the time there, way more than we did the other day. When people were informed that his sales pitch is attached to so much money, they started to see clearly what is happening. It's a sales pitch by someone pushing their own cause against the people and feeding a load of garbage to us to get it done. I personally won't stand for it if there is anything I can do about it. I'm just getting started and will not go away. I've looked up crime stats for our city, and according to cityrating.com, Bloomington crime rates are expected to be higher in 2020 than they were in 2016. The violent crime rate is 12% higher than the national average. The property crime rate is 30% higher than the national average. The property crime rate has risen 7% under his tenure and was already 23% higher than the national average. This is not a great success like he pitches in the newspaper. Honestly, though, all of that is not as relevant as the will of the people. So I asked the council members who came to educate, who came to my home and our neighborhood to educate the rest of the council on what percentage of the people you met agreed with the mayor and what percentage agreed with me. The answer is a rout. Every person was with me and zero for the mayor. Kroger, Kroger isn't open 24 hours anymore because of this. The dollar store manager won't move here when she lives 40 minutes away and said it is absolutely terrible compared to Mooresville where she was the manager before. The village the village pantry manager can't get store improvements because of loss of goods and paying customers don't want to go in there. Just last night, they had somebody jumping on everybody's car hoods at the village pantry and five cop cars out there. Just last night. The McDonald's manager has needles in the restroom and calls police regularly and they say they can't do anything. Wheels Auto has Shalom residents throwing feces on his cars for sale because he asked them not to bother his customers and stay away from his lot. So I'll finish with this. Are you, the board, going to do what is right for the people and stand up for the people against the mayor, spending all of this money to do, to do the opposite of what the, pe of the people's will, or the, of what the people want? If not, my belief and the belief of the people is that you should step down now and let someone else step up. If not, I guess we will have to step up in four years. Soon I'm going to start knocking doors all around, making social media pages, organizing protests, and walk down the middle of the street with signs like I saw the other day. I don't, have, I don't like having to be the person to lead the charge, but a real leader is needed to stop this. If you can't step up for us, then as the board, I respectfully ask you to step down. I will say that Mr. Flaherty and Mrs. Piedmont Smith were very respectful. Mr. Flaherty, I, Mr. Flaherty, I did investigate your housing first model. I have some issues with it. One major one is it says nothing in a person's history or present should stop them from being able to use that service. That's not good at all, and good luck selling that to anyone who actually studies it. Sir, your time expired, I'm afraid. <laughs> or were you nearly, nearly done? I'm nearly done, yes. It says we should house them whether or not they follow the rules or not, whether they participate in treatment or not, or whether they have a criminal record or not. You talk to the people who live in the area, they wouldn't go for that at all. Every person you talk to who are on the front lines this 24 hours a day told you these people could go to work and are playing the system. Do you work for us or the mayor? Does the mayor work for the people or his own agenda? Being a public servant is not easy. You aren't here to do what you think is right, but what the people want. Now that you know you should act immediately to step or step down, please don't ruin our city. And tonight, the people would like a response. Here is where, and there's only one more paragraph. Here, here, where it's here, where it's for everyone to see. If it's so great, proudly answer these questions. And Mr. Mayor, I welcome you to walk the neighborhood with me like the council representatives did. It won't be a good time for you, but I think it's time you come meet the people who live in the areas you're ruining. Thank you. I'll make time for it, if you will, because I care much about this city. Do you? 
Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there further public comment? You'll have another opportunity later in the meeting, if you choose. We'll now go to election of officers. Um, would someone like to make a motion? Yes, I would, Mr. President. I'd like to move for the, the year 2020. The officers of the council be as follows. For President, Council Member Stephen Bolin. For Vice President, Council Member Jim Sims. For Parliamentarian, Council Member Isabel Piedmont-Smith. Thank you. Is there a second? I second that. Very good. Uh, unless a roll call vote is desired, we'll, we'll proceed with a voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations to Council Members Volan, Sims, and Piedmont Smith. Uh, so now we'll take a brief recess while we occupy new seats. Thank you. To uh, say a few words about uh, the prior leadership, in particular uh, our former president. He's uh, done a great job in a very, very difficult year uh, where lots of difficult things happened. There were too, much item, too many items on the agenda, and uh, I just want to say uh, on behalf of the council how grateful we are for his service. So I'd like to present uh, this, this major award to Councilmember Dave Rallo for his presidency last year. Thank you. I suspect I know what this is. Oh, it is. Probably shaped like a gavel. It's a gavel, which I can use at home. <laughs> I just want to say uh, it's been an honor uh, serving this uh, body. And I want to thank all council members, past and present, for getting through a very difficult year, very challenging year. But we did. And I think the work was superb. So thank you for that. You're welcome, and thank you for your service. Um, also, I would like to say uh, welcome to our four new council members. I'll go from my left, uh, Council Member Ron Smith, Council Member Matt Flaherty, Council Member Kate Rosenbarger, and Council Member Sue Scambaluri. I welcome them all to a job that uh, Mr. Campbell described as fun. I'm not sure anybody here thinks uh, that highly of a uh, uh, presence on the council, but uh, certainly we have our light moments. But uh, we appreciate the, your, uh, Mr. Keppel's, uh, um, you know, exhortation to uh, uh, persevere in the face of uh, difficult times ahead. Uh, with that, we will now, now go to, um, well, first I just want to announce seats in order from my left, Councilmember Sandberg, Smith, Flaherty, Piedmont Smith, myself, Councilmember Sims, Rosenbarger, Scambaluri, and Rollo, these are the, uh, the seating arrangements that we have uh, agreed to. And now we will go to, uh, lost my agenda, here we are, to uh, appointments to, uh, to council appointments to uh, boards and commissions. To the Citizens Advisory Committee, um, Community Development Block Grants, CDBG, Social Services, uh, that's uh, Councilmember Smith. To the Physical Improvements part of the CDBG, Councilmember Rosenbarger. To the Commission for Bloomington Downtown, Councilmember Scambaluri. To the City Economic Development Commission, Councilmember Rosenberger. To the County Economic Development Commission, Councilmember Smith. To the Environmental Resource Advisory Committee, Councilmember Scambaluri. To the Metropolitan Planning Organization, Councilmember Flaherty. To the Plan Commission, Councilmember Sandberg. To the Solid Waste Management District, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. To the Board of the Urban Enterprise Association, Councilmember Rosenberger to the ex officio seat on the Utility Service Board, Councilmember Sims, to the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation, Councilmember Sims, to the Bloomington Commission on Sustainability, Councilmember Rollo, to the Parking Commission, uh, yours, yours truly, to the Public Safety Local Income Tax Allocation Committee, Councilmembers Piedmont Smith, Scambaluri, Sims, and Smith, and to the Monroe County Food and Beverage Tax Advisory Commission, Councilmember Volan, yours truly. So those are assignments to the to, uh, boards and commissions. Um, and then there are, yes? Point of order, don't we need to make a motion and vote on those? Uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, there, is there a motion to accept these appointments? So moved. Second. 
Motion and second. Uh, we'll do voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and those appointments are accepted. We'll now go to appointments to uh, council committees, and I'm missing my list here, uh, to the uh, Jack Hopkins Social Service Fund Committee, Council Members Sandberg, Smith, Flaherty, and Scambolluri. We have a fifth seat, uh, but Councilor Piedmont Smith does not want to continue, so we will leave it. It's, it's, we can always appoint it later. Uh, we'll leave it open for now. Uh, to the Sidewalk Committee, Council Members Rollo, Sims, Rosenbarger, and Smith. And to the Land Use Committee, Council Members Volan, Piedmont Smith, Flaherty, and Rosenbarger. Uh, do we, again, do we need a vote for that? Those are assignments of the president, so That's what I you're, thought. you're announcing them at this point. Right. So those are um, the committee assignments for now. Are there any questions? Yes, Council Member, or <laughs> Madam Clerk. Would you mind repeating your assignments for the Land Use Committee, please? For which one? The Land Use Committee. Uh, Council Members Volan, Piedmont Smith, Flaherty, and Rosenberger. Okay. With that, we will, um, Council Member Borrello, yes. Um, I would just like to ask if, um, uh, one of the council members might consider an addition or a substitution for council member Sandberg because council member Sandberg serves on the plan commission. It might be advantageous for council member Sandberg to also serve on the land use committee. My understanding is Sandberg prefers not to serve on the committee. I admit council member Sandberg. Uh, my preference is not to because again, when you are serving on the plan commission, you're doing a lot of work on that body, and I think it's duplicative to do it again on the land use, and then it comes to council. That being said, I certainly would serve if um, others on the council felt that that was a necessary balance to the land use committee. I would suggest that in the same way that um, uh, council members can change seats in writing if, they, if two members agree to switch. So if there are two members who would like to switch committee assignments, um, or if you know two members want to agree to switch, we can take care of it at that point. For the time being, I, I'd leave it this way, Councilor Sandberg. I will say that the requirements on the Planning Commission is a heavy lift, and adding additional, um, you know, committee assignments is not something that I'm eager to take on. Um, so I appreciate uh, Council Member Rollo for making that suggestion. Okay, we can discuss this at a later time. So thank you for that discussion. And switches can be made at any time with the agreement of council members. With that, it's time for us to move to legislation for second reading and resolutions. Mr. President, I move that resolution 20-02 be read by title and synopsis only. Be introduced and read by title and synopsis only. Needs a second. Uh, the motion to introduce and read Resolution 2002 has been made. All in favor? Yeah, that's All in right. favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Uh, will the clerk please read? Um, before Madam we clerk. move on to second reading, did you want, before we move on to second reading, did you want to do the interview committees as well? Oh, um, I neglected those. Yes, uh, the interview committees, um, these are appointments I make, so uh, they're simply going to, for the time being, they will be uh, replacing, the member will be replacing uh, uh, whoever served on that committee previously, so let me find uh, my apology for the delay here. Thank you, I got it. Uh, committee A will be Councilmember Sims, Smith, and Rosenbarger. Councilmember, or Committee B will be Councilmembers Flaherty, Scambolluri, and Volan. And Councilmember C, or Committee C, will be Piedmont Smith, Rollo, and Sandberg. Sorry about that. We have a motion on the table to introduce and read Resolution 2002. It's been, uh, the motion's been approved. Will the clerk please read? Resolution 2002 to approve the interlocal agreement between Monroe County, the Town of Ellettsville, and the City of Bloomington for animal shelter operation for the year 2020. The synopsis is as follows. 
This resolution authorizes execution by the Mayor and Director of Animal Care and Control of the Animal Shelter Interlocal Agreement for Fiscal Year 2020 between the City of Bloomington, Monroe County, and Town of Ellettsville. The agreement provides that Monroe County shall pay the City of Bloomington the sum of $330,878.41 for 2020 in return for the space the City provides to the County and services it renders on the County's behalf. The agreement further provides that the Town of Ellettsville shall provide the City of Bloomington the sum of $19,270.22 for 2020 in return for the space the City provides the Town of Ellettsville and services it renders to the, on the Town of Ellettsville's behalf. In total, the City will receive $350,148.63 from this county and town. You do not have a committee recommendation. I move that resolution 20-02 be adopted. Uh, who is here to present on this resolution? Please come up. This is our first piece of legislation for the year 2020. Uh, congratulations on the honor of getting to present first. You must be very excited. I am so excited. Um, Virgil Sauter, Director of Animal Care and Control for the City of Bloomington. Um, so this agreement before you is um, for the animal shelter to provide housing and care for the animals coming from the town of Ellsville as well as Monroe County. Uh, the figure before you that was accepted on is based on 2018's actual expenditures um, towards the shelter portion of our budget. That number is reduced by the 2018 adoption revenue taken in and then the percentage of animals that come from those sources is applied to that figure to come up with what we have before you. I will note that um, last year's interlocal was slightly different than this year's. Um, last year, the percentage from Monroe County and Ellisville sources was 49%, which is one of the highest percentages it's been in the last decade. Um, in 2017, that figure dropped down to 40, a little over 44%. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take those at this time. I neglected to ask you to oh. state your name and position. I, I, I yeah. Okay, good. All right, I'd be happy to again. No, no, no. <laughs> Let's go now to questions from council members. Councilmember Rallo. Mr. Souter, I had a question about uh, policies that was adopted several years ago I think it was before you took over as director, and that was fees that would be required for um, submitting animals from outside the county. Right. And could you could you talk about that a little bit? In other words, um, are the fees adequate to cover that that expense? And has there been an incre you know steady number that comes in, or is that has that um, reduce the number of animals submitted to our shelter? It, it hasn't made a change. Um, that first occurred back in 2013. Um, that year it did drop from 15% down to 11%. We have since climbed back up. Last year we were actually low at about 12% our intake coming from out of county. Any animal coming outside of Monroe is charged currently. It's $20 for every adult animal, um, 25 if it's a litter of under five. So like the litter kittens, number five or less, it's only $25 for that litter of kittens. Um, those have been adequate. We are looking at costs are increasing, so we are looking at increasing those numbers in the near future. I see, thank you. Council Morello, further questions for Mr. Souter? Seeing none, oh, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I kind of hate to ask this, and it's only marginally relevant, but I am interested to know um, what the euthanasia rate is this year compared with last. Um, we are pretty much, I'm still fine tuning the statistics for 2019, but we're pretty much on par with what we were last year, which is around 6%. Um, I will point out that I just received today um, some really old stats. Back in 2003, our euthanasia rate was 61%. So we have made some outstanding improvements there. Um, 
so yeah, it's six percent is is good. That means our our save rate or all animals that are remain alive is at ninety four percent. Very good, thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, we'll go to the public for comment on resolution twenty oh two. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, we'll come back to the council for debate. Is there any comment from member? Or I'll also entertain a motion. Call the question. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Rallo? Yes. <coughs> Councilmember Smith? Oh, Scambellari, yes, I'm yes. really out of order. I apologize for that. <laughs> Rosenbarger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Volan? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes. You skipped Council Member Scambellari. No. No, I didn't. I cannot hear anything tonight. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, that motion passes 9-0, and somehow we've passed our first resolution of the year. Let's go now to the next item on the agenda. Mr. President, Mr. President I move that resolution 20-03 be um, introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Will the clerk please read? Resolution 2003, to approve of the interlocal cooperation agreement between the City of Bloomington and Monroe County, Indiana, regarding the Building Code Authority. The synopsis is as follows. The attached interlocal cooperation agreement, Exhibit A, extends through January 1st, 2021, the long-term arrangement between the City of Bloomington and Monroe County to combine and coordinate the provision of certain building code services. This interlocal cooperation is authorized by Indiana Code Section 36171. There's no committee recommendation. Thank you. Mr. President, I move that Resolution 20-03 be adopted. Second. Uh, who is here? Uh, Councilor, or, uh, sorry, Corporation Council of Philippa Guthrie is here to present. Hello, Ms. Guthrie. Thank you. Good evening. Philippa Guthrie, Corporation Council. Um, you've seen this um, every year. It's been in place since 1996 with a few variations over the years. It originally was a five-year agreement, but um, we've been making it a one-year agreement uh, over the last few years. So uh, this is um, an interlocal agreement whereby the county manages all of, issues all of the building permits, even for the city. Uh, they keep the fees for the building permits, and they transmit to us fees for uh, a zoning. It's a zoning fee. Um, and that is the only exchange of money. Um, it will be for one year through next January, 2021, January 1st. Um, and it will be reevaluated then again. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Guthrie. Are there questions on Resolution 2003 from council members? I have one. Um, it's January 8th. If this uh, agreement expires January 1st, then I assume that last year's expired January 1st. What are we doing right now? Uh, we're asking, uh, I forgot that. We're asking for it to be retroactive to the second. Um, we'll have the same problem next year. Can we make it retroactive? Can we make it expire? on the first meeting of the council yes, next year? Yes, well, it, that was part of the problem was your schedule last year was so packed with the UDO, um, so we, we just decided to push it off because it, was, it wasn't going to fit onto the calendar at the very end. So it's something that you'll do in December? Yes, yes. It was compounded by the fact that our planning attorney had left and the planning staff was doing the UDO. So there, were, there was kind of a confluence of events this past <laughs> fall. The only other question I'll ask is, um, how is the relationship going? I take it that we're satisfied with the way the county's handling yes, building yes. permits? It, it works pretty seamlessly with the planning staff and the, the building permit staff. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, we'll go to the public for comment on resolution 2003. Is there any public comment? 
Seeing none, we'll come back to the council for debate. Is there a member who has a comment on resolution 2003? Call the question. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Will the clerk please call the roll? See if I can do it right this time. Council member Scambaluri? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Volan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the next item of the agenda. <laughs> Mr. President, I move that resolution 20-01 be introduced and read by the city clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Will the clerk please call the roll? Or sorry, no, will the clerk please read. read? I'm sorry. Resolution 2001 to establish standing committees and abolish other certain committees of the Common Council. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution is sponsored by Council Member Volan and proposes the creation of various council standing committees along with the dissolution of council interviewing committees. The council sponsor is Council Member Volan and there is no committee recommendation. Thank you. I move that resolution 20-01 be adopted. Okay, seeing as I'm the sponsor of this, I'm going to pass the gavel to Vice President Sims so I can make a presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sims. I need a minute to set up here. I'm having trouble, just a minute, please. I shall, oh, here we go. So uh, this resolution proposes that we establish uh, several more standing committees than we already have. Uh, we have uh, the Jack Hopkins Social Service Fund Committee. We have the Sidewalk Committee. And we have the PS Lit um, uh, Allocation Committee. These are examples of committees that do not expire. And uh, in regular parlance, they're called standing committees. Uh, I'm proposing that we create seven more committees uh, and really nothing more than that. And uh, I cannot use my remote from this far away, so I'm going to have to go to the laptop to continue presenting. My apology. So what are committees? It's often uh, the source of confusion. The term is very similar to uh, commission, but a committee is nothing more than a subset of the legislative body, a group of council members and not all of them. Uh, boards and commissions are uh, mostly citizen-driven entities. There are times when, as you heard tonight, some members of council uh, have an ex officio seat on a given board or commission, but uh, boards and commissions are created either by statute or by uh, action of the council to take up a particular issue um, uh, through citizen action and input. Uh, but council committees are simply a way of breaking down the work of the legislature. Uh, a committee only makes a recommendation. There are only a couple of cities in uh, the state of Indiana where a committee can kill legislation like uh, Congress allows. But the vast majority of cities that use committees, and they all use committees, um, the body is recommending only. So if a subset of, uh, say, four members uh, studies an issue and uh, comes up with a conclusion, uh, they're not technically making a decision except to make a recommendation to the full council, which has final authority over anything considered by a committee. 
Um, I see committees, uh, standing committees, as a substitute for the Committee of the Whole. The Committee of the Whole is a complicated idea, but it basically means that all nine members of council technically act as a committee, making a recommendation to ourselves at a regular session. I found that this is very confusing uh, to the public, and it also uh, has a number of other problems that I'll talk about as I go through the idea of committees. Uh, committees are defined in city code. They have been there at least since 1979. Uh, in Chapter 2.04, Article 3, there are several uh, sections that discuss how committees should work. So it's not like I'm inventing something. Committees are a time-honored tradition of breaking down the workload that uh, a legislature faces. Uh, committees, according to city code, may call hearings to investigate other areas within their jurisdiction. Technically, uh, the council has the authority by statute to investigate and oversee any aspect of the um, execution of city governance, in other words, of the executive. I don't mean here to emphasize the word investigate. Uh, it, it seems a little harsher than it is, but council does have the ability to dig into issues. And the best mechanism to do that is by formally assigning a subset of members to take point on those issues. That's in city code. A committee shall meet on call of its chair or any two of its members. So if uh, members of committee feel that there's an issue that needs to be addressed, they have the ability to do so. Uh, committees shall report a recommendation within two regular sessions. This is an important function of creating a standing committee. Right now, as a committee of the whole works, we do something and we, we introduce legislation and first reading and ordinance. And then we automatically refer to the Committee of the Whole, which meets the following Wednesday, according to city code. The Committee of the Whole cannot extend itself. So by the end of that meeting, the, the Committee of the Whole, the nine members uh, in the so-called committee, have to make some kind of recommendation. And then the committee dissolves. And it, the recommendation goes back to the city council. The problem with this is that it creates a uh, decide already um, a tone among the council. There's less than seven days after that committee has made a decision, uh, the committee of the whole, for anyone to amend the ordinance if so needed. And the council has historically been reluctant to go to a third reading. So under a standing committee system, uh, the committee has, if it's something is referred to a subset of council, a standing committee, that committee has until the second regular session. In other words, it effectively has a month instead of two weeks to send back a recommendation, uh, automatically giving it time to think about it or to get more data when data is not forthcoming or to propose an amendment in a way that's not rushed and where it can be considered and put in the packet. Uh, notice that uh, if the committee does not report back by the second regular session, the council takes it up as if there was no recommendation made because effectively there wasn't one. So, uh, like I said, a committee cannot veto legislation or otherwise uh, kill it. How would committees work? So again, committees make recommendations only. They are not, the, no decision of a committee is binding. I'm gonna be recommending that committees be made of four members, so that's visibly, uh, that's obvious to people that a, a minority of council members may not uh, decide on it. Some cities have five member committees, some have three. Um, at second reading, after the presentation of the ordinance before the full council, we would simply hear the committee report. What did the committee learn about this piece of legislation? Uh, uh, you know, what opinion, what recommendation do they make to the full council? And uh, uh, if not everybody agreed with that report, whoever is in the minority in the committee may also make a comment. Um, so I, I made it that point. So the, as you just heard, the president can make assignments to committees. Uh, the code calls for at least three people per committee. Again, uh, as we already have with most of our committees, I'm recommending four members. Uh, I'm proposing nine substantive committees. When all is said and done, we already have a couple. Um, and, but it theoretically allows every member of the council to have four committee assignments. and it allows every member to chair one if we, if we see fit. How do we schedule committees? According to city code, in order, if, if uh, we're going to be using standing committees instead of committee of the whole, 
uh, city code requires uh, that, first of all, to be referred to uh, when, when legislation is first read, it must at that point be referred to a committee. Uh, the committee uh, uh, would have to meet in such a way that any other committees that would meet on, uh, they would have to meet on the second or fourth Wednesday, which are the nights traditionally reserved for Committee of the Whole. Uh, so that every member of council can attend any given committee meeting, they have to be scheduled serially. And uh, those meetings cannot start before 5.30, and they cannot start after 9.45. But this gives us opportunity to have as many as three or four committee meetings in one night. How long would the meetings last? In order for serial meetings to work, they would have to have start times and end times. And that means that uh, uh, the emphasis for the committee is not on long uh, dissertations on the topic, but rather they're doing triage. They're figuring out what issues are not really of a concern to the council, what issues are uh, perhaps of a concern that's beyond the scope of the committee. And then they might uh, try to uh, resolve issues that can be solved in committee, questions can be answered, uh, issues addressed, and perhaps even amendments uh, proposed. Uh, but the, the key thing about the committee is that it gives them an automatic opportunity for a second uh, hearing to discuss the issue, which is, again, what I said about uh, amendments being able to be made. Uh, uh, they have this uh, by right. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can't send back legislation early. Uh, they can do that in the same pace that the Committee of the Whole does, where uh, after one hearing they decide, oh, nothing controversial about this, we'll send it back to, to the Council after this one meeting, and the Council gets it back at the same rate that they had under Committee of the Whole. But if they need the extra two weeks, they have that opportunity. How long should a committee hearing be? Some can be as short as 15 minutes or half an hour if something is not very controversial. But the maximum I would recommend is two hours. We do have uh, an example of a standing committee that's been up for a couple of years, the Land Use Committee. Uh, we have not needed more than two hours in a given week in order to address an issue, although in uh, many cases we did have a second hearing on a PUD. Uh, this schedule is, at least for the committee part of legislation, much more predictable to the administration, to the petitioner, to the public. You will know what time the committee is meeting. You will know what time they're ending. The only way we can guarantee uh, that every member of council can attend every committee hearing is by making sure that there's only one at a time. And so that means we have to put a, a hard limit on it. That means time limits. Uh, if you look back at every uh, land use committee meeting, we succeeded in meeting those time limits over the past two years. When we advertised an amount of time, we finished in that amount of time. It is possible to do it. What are the benefits of committees? Number one, it gives us greater control over our increasingly burdensome agenda. Uh, it gives us a, a one-month legislative cycle by default, even though it allows us to send it back early. But it gives us more calendar time to deliberate and form amendments, even though it limits the clock time of a meeting. It does let members specialize and focus in topics that are important, particularly to district representatives who have particular concerns. Um, it relieves the obligation for every council member to be present at every committee hearing week, uh, but without preventing their ability to attend uh, the, uh, any given committee. So pe people can, who like the committee of the whole can still attend every meeting without much change in their, um, their habit but it does reduce the net amount of hours that council members spend in meetings because not everybody has to attend every committee week. Members on a committee have better knowledge for evaluating nominations to boards and commissions. Uh, this would eliminate the need for separate nominating committees. Uh, the current method of our schedule is really only convenient for council members. It's not really convenient for anybody else. Um, petitioners, staff, and the public have had to wait on committee the whole nights three plus hours for their issue to come up because we're only one body at the Committee of the Whole and we have to plow through everything we had to pick an order. Uh, limited duration hearings would make our committee schedule more predictable, I've already mentioned that. And uh, right now, as we saw from last year, we just have so much on our agenda. We actually had uh, more on it's being scheduled than we could handle. Uh, we had the 1030 rule invoked very frequently. 
that's a rule in city code that says that if we go past 1030, it requires a supermajority vote to, to introduce a new piece of legislation. I take that uh, limit seriously. And uh, I think I've already said this, committee members are more likely to be knowledgeable about uh, people who they would nominate to boards and commissions. What precedents do we have? Uh, there are 26 second class and uh, first class cities in the state. The only two cities I don't have data on are Greenwood and Jeffersonville. All the other 24 cities have some kind of committee system where they send all their legislation to some committee. Uh, none uses the committee of the whole exclusively as we have done. Um, again, our cycle is arbitrarily fast. No city has a two week legislative cycle from first reading to final passage. They typically take a month to make a decision, no matter how quickly they, they spend time in meeting doing it. The average city has about eight committees. Uh, some cities have third readings, like in South Bend. Some meet in regular session monthly, like Lafayette. Many cities meet in committee just minutes before the regular session, like in Terre Haute. And legislative cycles can overlap, like in Gary. Um, the most common uh, committees to be found among our peer cities a full 19 of them have a specific committee for budget or finance. I'm not proposing that. I'm proposing that we use Committee of the Whole for budgets, as we have. 16 cities have a public safety committee. 15 have some kind of planning committee. They may be a different name, but they cover this basic task. 14 have a public works committee. 10 have a parks and rec committee. There are other committees like rules, utilities, economic development, community and family resources, schools, transportation. Uh, some unique committees, Anderson has an aviation committee and a light committee. Indianapolis has a municipal corporations committee. Michigan City has a humane activities committee and a waters and harbors committee, something we don't have much use for. West Lafayette has a Purdue relations committee. Maybe we could use one of those. Locally, again, standing committee language has been in our code for 40 years. Uh, we've had standing committee, uh, committees for years. And we have a vestigial item in our agenda uh, under item four, part three, is reports from council committees, which we almost never use. Uh, this is for when a, a standing committee has studied an issue that is not the subject of legislation, a power that it has in addition to uh, holding a piece of legislation for two um, legislative cycles. And um, this is the point where they would report. So uh, that's been on our agenda as long as I've been on council but we've almost never used it. It's there because of this aspect of code that I'm asking us to trigger. So here's the slate I propose. We already have a Jack Hopkins Social Services Fund. I propose that we uh, keep it. If anything, we should strike the word fund and send other issues regarding social services, particularly emergency social services, to that committee for consideration if such legislation ever were to come forward, but that exists already. And we also have a land use standing committee that's been working for two years. And it uh, would be it's it would be the liaison for council to the planning and transportation department's planning division. I'm proposing seven more committees: an administration committee that would be liaison to the clerk, controller, human resources, information technology services, the legal department, and the public works divisions of facilities and fleet. Uh, the community affairs committee would be a liaison to community and family resources and to the parks and rec department. Parks and Rec is here because it appears to be a very uh, low generator of uh, legislation to the council. So uh, it, this was the place that it fit best. It's the one incongruous uh, department liaison in this slate. Uh, the Housing Committee would be li liaison to the Hand Department. The Public Safety Committee would consider issues regarding fire, police, and animal control, which we just heard tonight. That resolution, if it went to committee, would have gone to the uh, Public Safety Committee. A Sustainability, Climate Action, and Resilience Committee that would interface with the Economic and Sustainable Development uh, Department. A Transportation Committee, which would interface with Bloomington Transit, the Transportation Division of uh, Planning and Transportation, and the Streets Department of Public Works. And finally, a Utilities and Sanitation Committee, which would interf interface with the two, with the department and the division in question. Note that again, we still have uh, what I will consider special committees that just handle the very particular um, uh, tasks that have been uh, sent to them year after year. The sidewalk committee, which uh, expends the money that we set aside for building new sidewalks, and the public safety local income tax allocation committee, which is relatively new the past couple of years, which allocates that particular tax. So that's it. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I do understand that there's some uh, concerns 
about uh, committees and that uh, we are, um, that the several members are considering a postponement to uh, the next regular session. I would support that because I recognize that even though this is a resolution, uh, it has a lot of ramifications for how we do business. So with that, I'm going to return to my seat and uh, happy to take questions from people. Are there any, uh, Mr. Mr. Sims? Okay, thank you for that report. Um, do we have any questions um, for the presenter from the council? I have a of information. Uh, yes, sir. Um, council, Member, uh, council President Volan already mentioned uh, a motion to postpone action on the legislation. Um, I intend to make that motion um, until a later date. Uh, he, he mentioned a date. Uh, since that motion will close debate, um, I would like to continue the discussion um, because I think that would be useful. But I'd like to hear if other dates of, if council members have other dates in mind, and perhaps we can also inquire of our council attorney what's on our schedule uh, in anticipation of postponing for a week or perhaps more. So I'm just making that uh, uh, known, if if you, people could specify a date, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. I would certainly second the motion to postpone. My major concern would be how much time do we need to vet all of this with the people that this will have a direct impact on, and that's our administration and our staff. And to my satisfaction, I don't know that that has been done. Um, so for my purposes, I would need to make sure there was a very robust discussion that was held with the members of this executive branch whose job it is to um, manage the majority of the functions that are listed up here. I find this to be perhaps dupl duplicative if we don't have the express um, uh, information as to what's this going to do uh, for their schedules, for how they manage their time, which is, you know, generally they are the boots on the ground, daytime staff who handle all of these issues from in the morning until the evening, and then perhaps being called into evening sessions beyond. Um, I think it's very important to get staff buy-in from the administration. So I don't know if a week's enough time for a postponement. I would suggest two. I believe we are on questions regarding the actual resolution that is on the table. I was about to make that point. Um, you would, as, as a sponsor, I'd like to ask, is there a member of the administration here who would like to address the proposal? Uh, seeing none, I'd like to point out that uh, this is a privilege of the council to decide how it does business, how to organize itself. This is a proposal to reorganize the way we do business. And uh, I note that the absence of um, uh, an administration official shows a relative lack of concern. Nevertheless, I, uh, I mean, even though this is a resolution, I'm happy to treat it like an ordinance, which is going at the same rate that an ordinance would. With that, I'm taking more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is that a continuation of the presentation? That's just a response. Just a response. Um, any further questions? Council Member Sandberg. Is it my understanding that there is a meeting scheduled for Friday that uh, staff has been invited to attend? Uh, if I may, uh, there is a work session scheduled for Friday. This is on it. Uh, there was an uh, uh, administration member, uh, Deputy Mayor Van Eisen, present at the leadership meeting where this was discussed on Tuesday. Uh, this went out in the packet on Friday. It is literally getting the exact same treatment that any other resolution or ordinance gets. It's scheduled at the same rate. So they could, they could have been here if they chose to. They chose not to. They may come next week. Uh, I would encourage them to. I would like to hear as well what they think of this. But I would urge them to consider that this ought to make their business easier as well as other people's. Thank you. I think many are scheduled for Friday. Council Member Pete Mott Smith. Yes, um, I had a question about the Standing Committee for Sustainability, Climate Action, and Resilience. Um, it makes sense that. Uh, it would um, be the liaison committee for the Economic and Sustainable Development Department. 
Um, I am curious, though, why that committee would be an appropriate place for the Arts Commission to be appointed from and to kind of be overseen by that standing committee, since, um, I mean, certainly the arts can, can be melded with climate action in certain circumstances, but it's, it's not, uh, to me, it, it doesn't, it's not the most logical place for the Arts Commission. Um, if you could respond to that. I could. Not visible in this presentation were how we would uh, change the way we nominate uh, members of the public to boards and commissions. As it is now, we have three uh, nominating committees. They are appointed randomly. Uh, they were assigned uh, uh, boards and commissions to uh, decide council appointees to uh, based on sort of a arbitrary uh, schedule. Uh, Commission A has 22 seats to name. Commission B has 26 seats to name. Commission C has 30 seats to name. Uh, what I don't have up here, and I can certainly provide that next week, is a chart of how this would break down uh, to how the nine committees would subsume the role of nominating committees. Uh, and they, the committees are um, assigned to them according to a logical attachment, like, you know, and the question that Councilor Piedmont Smith asks is where should the Arts Commission go? Because the Arts Commission is part of the Economic and Sustainable Development Department, that's where it is by default. Um, this is the first time that uh, we're seriously considering a full slate of committees, and so uh, my decision to create these committees is arbitrary. I certainly welcome changes to it that make sense to members, including subtracting or adding a committee. I'm happy to see the Bloomington Arts Commission moved to the community, uh, this is the community affairs uh, committee, but uh, three of these committees would have a comparable number of seats to name as the three nominating committees do now. Uh, community affairs would have the most at 27 seats. But I do want to point out that uh, no committee has more than a current uh, arbitrarily named nominating committee has. They all have 20 some seats to name. Only three of these committees would have a lot of seats. Uh, community affairs would have 27. Sustainability would have 21. Transportation would have 15. There are 15 other seats that the other six committees would split. So they have very few uh, nominations. So I'm okay with moving it to say community affairs, but that would add several more seats to community affairs. It would put them above 30 seats. Something to think about for people who would be a member of the community affairs committee. Uh, but I do welcome, uh, I mean, th there will be a, there's a list in the packet of what um, boards and commissions each committee would be responsible for nominating citizens to. I encourage people to look in the packet to see what's what. Okay, I have a question. When you say these committees will subsume the nominating committees, does that eliminate the com nominating committees? By subsuming their duties, it would obviate their need. We would eliminate those committees. Councilmember Rallo. Uh, I could see legislation bridging some of these um, committees, in other words, um, shared by committees. Um, so my first question is, who refers legislation to these committees? How is that process done? Um, before we changed the rules about four years ago, we automatically uh, uh, assigned all legislation to Committee of the Whole. It was an automatic function of council. The code said uh, the council shall assign legislation to uh, Committee of the Whole, and the, uh, the code said the council may assign legislation to a uh, standing committee. We changed code about four years ago to say that the uh, council may refer to Committee of the Whole or may refer to Standing Committee. So we have the choice. And what we've seen in the past term is uh, if a majority feel like uh, legislation should be, um, uh, like we had the Land Use Committee in, starting in 2017, and uh, uh, we made a point of making the motion to refer it to, land, to refer a piece of legislation to Land Use Committee. If there was a majority that wanted to hear it uh, in Committee of the Whole, uh, a person can so move that. And so a five-member vote of the council would have it heard by Committee of the Whole. That has not changed. So um, as president, I would move by default to go to the appropriate committee for any piece of legislation. 
but uh, if a member wanted to make a motion, the, the code actually says we first have to move to a standing committee. And if that motion fails, then we have a motion to refer to committee of the whole. So the opportunity is there, but first we have to try uh, deciding what committee to assign it to. I think you had a second question. I did, but I'll defer to no, another council member. Well, my other question is really unrelated. It has to do with sequence of uh, the hearings. And so, say on a Wednesday evening, you have multiple pieces of legislation that go to separate standing committees. And so they are, the times are specifically circumscribed, um, I assume by leadership and um, say that the debate extends further than that particular time slot allows. And say in the case of land use or um, some other topic that's very complicated, um, one has staff, one has consultants, uh, you, you have uh, the petitioner, you have public, you have multiple people who are assembled uh, to resolve a matter, and one has an arbitrary limit on time because now you're b bumping up against the next standing committee time slot. And so instead of resolving that topic, you end up having to postpone it. And so it, it, it really, what, what might occur is sort of a log jam of legislation then. How would you respond to that? Well, first of all, that happened. Uh, there was a land use committee and a committee of the whole on the same night. And uh, the council decided to put the committee of the whole first. Councilor Sturbaum was the chair of that committee of the whole, and he was not attentive to the time of the committee of the whole, and it ran into the beginning time of the land use committee meeting. And the land use committee is where you often have consultants, expensive uh, bond counsel and uh, lawyers and, you know, and architects presenting something. And I was unhappy with it, but I had to live with it. Um, I, uh, as a, the chair of the land use committee, I was very conscious from the outset of the meeting that I had to wind up at a certain time. So I put limits on everybody. I put limits on the presentation. I put limits on the question period. I put limits on the individual's uh, uh, opportunity to ask a question. I put limits on the public comment and on the individual member's ability to comment. And I put a four minute max limit on the members of the committee. And they were all able to get their comments in within that four minutes. Every member of the committee recognized that we only have so much time and that the meeting has to end at a certain time. It is possible if the chair is determined at the beginning of the meeting to end the meeting by the ending time, and it's respectful to everyone, including the people who are gathered here for that issue, the members of the public, the, the administration staff. If it's clear to everybody assembled that the discussion won't be over, that's why uh, the committee has the right to a second hearing, um, and why it has uh, until the second regular session to, set, to come back to talk about it. Uh, if everybody at the outset knows that we can't talk all night, then we won't talk all night. We'll postpone to the second meeting. Uh, I think it instills discipline in everyone, most importantly in council members. Thank you. Council members, Gambler. Yes, thank you. Um, First Council Member Roland, thank you for the thought you've clearly put into this. We do have a workload that needs to be managed, and, and I appreciate the thought you've put into this. Um, as I think about proposals like this, I think in terms of measures of success. If we adopt this and it's six months from now or 12 months from now and it's gone well, how would we know? Um, what would that look like? And so the notion of measures of success is important to me. I'd be interested in having you comment on that. Um, and we've talked a little bit about staff and staff time, but I'm particularly interested too, all of us have the goal of citizen engagement um, and providing opportunities for citizens to engage and offer comment and be more involved in this process. Um, could you speak to how this proposed slate of committees would, would make us better at that? Thank you. First of all, as with respect to time, I think everyone will find it more satisfying to come to a meeting that they know has an end time. I think you're gonna hear uh, after a few months that members of the public who came here in the past and had to sit through hours and hours of discussion, uh, let alone of discussion unrelated to the issue that they were here for, 
have trouble predicting at what time they should come when their issue is up. This eliminates that trouble. If there is a, say, a community affairs committee meeting at 6.30 and the land use meeting at 8, you know when to come, whether you're a member of the public, a member of the administration staff, the petitioner, or frankly, the council member. I think council members will be more satisfied that they don't have to attend to every issue in committee because they're not a member of that committee and they don't have the obligation of being here for committee of the whole. Uh, I think you're going to see that if everyone is required to keep an eye on time, that meetings will be shorter and yet deliberation can still be held. It's just spread out over the calendar. So I don't know how to measure that kind of satisfaction except in people saying, I love the new system. I'm hoping that you're going to hear a lot of people saying that. Um, you know, the only objection that I can imagine having to the system from a time point of view is a member who might say, are we really deliberating enough on this issue? That is for the council to decide at regular session. That's what regular session is for. That's why minutes are kept at regular session, but minutes where we have knockdown, drag out debates at the Committee of the Whole are not kept. We don't keep minutes for that purpose. And then at uh, regular session, you hear council members saying, well, we talked about all that at the Committee of the Whole, so I'm not going to repeat myself. But I mean, there's no written record of it. There'll at least be some written record of it in the minute of the debate if uh, we have all nine members debating only in regular session. Uh, with respect to um, uh, other measures of satisfaction, uh, I think that knowing uh, that, that members of council being more familiar with the, citizen, the, the boards and commissions that they have to nominate to will be good, it will create a higher quality of nominee. It's kind of hard to measure. I think that uh, having a liaison on council, each department having a liaison in the form of a certain committee, certain members, and the chair of that committee will uh, provide them more satisfaction with somebody who knows what's going on with that department as opposed to the randomly chosen committee of the whole chair for that week. Um, so these things are hard to measure. I, I would simply describe it as you will find greater satisfaction with, uh, among all members of the public and the administration um, with interactions with the council. Um, I, that's the best I can do, I think, at the moment. D did I answer your second question? I'm sorry. Your second question, did I answer? Oh, well, there was a second part to your question. Yeah, I just did. In particular, how is it going to enhance citizen opportunities for citizen engagement? We've talked about our process, but and we certainly need to attend to that. But I was particularly interested in citizen engagement. Too. Well, for example, uh, with scheduling serial committee meetings, uh, if somebody knows when their topic is going to be brought up, they don't have to be here all night. Someone with small children who has a babysitter, somebody who's got something else scheduled and they can't be here. If they know the meeting's at 9 o'clock, they can make plans for it. But right now, we have Committee of the Whole starting at 6.30. There might be three items on the agenda. And like uh, one of the last meetings of last year, there was a gentleman who was here from the administration. What was his name again? I keep forgetting. He had to wait three and a half hours yeah, uh, for his issue to be brought up. It was a minor issue, but he had to sit through everything else. I think that the only people who benefit from the Committee of the Whole are council members. And even we don't benefit because we have to sit through everything. And we don't all need to sit through every issue every committee week. So I think that that would be the, the most tangible benefit to the public, would be more predictable times for when we'll hear issues. Thank you. Council Member Rollo. I'm sorry. Council Member Rollo. Thank you. Um, so one benefit I see of the Committee of the Whole is that um, having the collective wisdom of nine participants, nine council members, uh, brings forward ideas and questions and debate that you know, one individual, you know, may not, it may not evolve from. Um, and the other aspect of it is that these kinds of debate um, often lead to questions of, like, of material substance, like data. So there's been inquiries about data that come from that collective wisdom that are issued to a staff member that then provides it by the regular session so that we have that at hand. Um, isn't that, a, isn't that a, a, a function that works well for the Committee of the Whole? No. And it doesn't? OK. I can tell you why. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No. Just tell me why. Well, for example, I have been in Committee of the Whole, and I've asked for data. 
and the administration did not get the data back to me by the next week. Member Committee of the Whole comes uh, one week after first reading where we actually discuss the issue, and then uh, the next week is regular session, and that's when we decide. And if the administration doesn't provide the data, it's rare for the council to vote to postpone until the data is, is gotten. In the committee system, uh, there's an extra two weeks built in. A second hearing can be had. If there's insufficient data that night, uh, it's, there's more time for the data to be gotten. And the committee can make sure that the data is ready for the full council when it comes back to regular session. So that's one example. As far as collective wisdom goes, the, co the downside to that is that uh, in Committee of the Whole, uh, everyone has a tendency to want to comment or to ask questions because they don't want to seem like they're disinterested. And uh, you know, while sure there's collective wisdom, it also extends meetings when the goal of a committee is to triage, is to figure out what are the basic um, problems here that the full council needs to think about, not let's pontificate about this issue right away. So that's another reason why I think that the committee system is superior. Could, could I just expound a bit? Um, so, um, well, if, if, if the goal is to um, reduce comment, then it seems to me then time should be addressed, not, uh, not, not changing the process to such a degree. But that's, that's more, OK, isn't that true? That is not my comment. But, but back, to, uh, back to the first question, um, it seems to me that there might be questions that evolve from, the, from nine members, and that could only happen, really, uh, at, at, in a nine-member body, such as ours, and uh, that might require another regular session. In other words, if we don't, wouldn't that be true? If, if the committee couldn't think of all the questions, obviously can't, of all nine members, um, it might lead to additional meetings, regular sessions. That's also the case for um, the 1030 rule. I mean, right now, the council does not really respect the public's time. We'll decide uh, a meeting at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning because the way our rules are set up, we have to decide tonight. Again, we have the fastest legislative cycle in the state, and it's arbitrary. Why? Uh, there is plenty of time. To, like, let's make the better decision, not the quicker one. Uh, I don't think quicker decisions are better, and I don't think staying up all night is good for public involvement. Uh, again, let's get rid of the 1030 rule if we are so careless about it. But I would suggest that regardless of what system we use, yes, we should be more respectful of time. I should be on a timer right now, but we don't have that rule yet. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I just wanted to clarify, uh, Councilmember Volan, under your proposal, does uh, item of legislation um, necessarily or automatically re be, get referred to a standing committee, or could it still go to committee of the whole? I, yeah, I have addressed this. Um, it, uh, um, it does not automatically go to committee of the whole. We don't have that in city code. It may go to either City, a committee of the whole or a standing committee. Um, the only thing we say is that we must first try to send it to standing committee, and if the vote to that fails, then a motion to assign uh, to the committee of the whole is appropriate. Does that answer your question? Yes. Council Member Flaherty. Uh, yes, there was a mention in the packet about uh, m memorializing the meetings, um, and I mentioned specifically that uh, council members should be mindful that of a potential short turnaround time uh, for a report back, uh, say the second Wednesday that a standing committee meets um, and, and reporting back to the full council. If, if we wanted to include it in that packet for the second regular session, um, it would need to be done by Friday. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the process of, of the land use committee and how that report back has been done. Can you speak to that concern and, and uh, what your thoughts are? Yes, so the idea of a committee report is meant to be very brief. It me it's meant to discuss what topics were brought up, were there any substantial decisions made by the council. Um, I would encourage everyone to go back and look at reports of the Land Use Committee. These are some of the most substantive uh, issues that a committee could hear, our PUDs, for example. And you'll see that the recommendations of the Land Use Committee are very similar to 
the reasonable conditions called for in a PUD. It's a bullet list of certain items that were of concern, um, and the typical report is on the order of two paragraphs. It's meant to be something that can be assembled very quickly um, and turned around in a day or so. So I've had no trouble filing those reports for the committee, um, and uh, there have been minority votes where a, a person who was not of the majority uh, spoke to an issue, and they didn't take very long either. Overall, the report is a couple minutes. Uh, just a quick follow-up, if that's okay, uh, related. Yes. Um, it, so it's the ch chairperson who's, who's responsible for uh, report, the report back, is that correct? Is that what that's I correct. They may delegate to a member of the committee, but uh, the chairperson has to make sure the report is filed. Okay, I have one. Um, with this discussion on Committee of the Whole, it seems as though this has not so much been eliminated, but being pushed to the side. It, it, is that fair to say? Yes, um, I mean, oh. No, no, yes is fine. Um, but the question I do have is, um, on the extended period of deliberation section, um, should the council wish to extend the discussion of an item being considered to the next Committee of the Whole, rather than returning it to the next regular session, then it could amend local code to do so. Can you explain that process and what that means? Sure, I wanna point out that what I'm proposing tonight is a resolution that only requires one reading. An ordinance is a change to city code that requires two readings, which is what some members have suggested this deserves tonight, uh, which is fine with me. Um, I purposely did not want to propose an ordinance change because I didn't think it was necessary. All I want to do is trigger existing code, which says, yes, we can make more committees. Let's make some more. Even if we don't use them that often, their existence allows us to say, we've declared these four members a specialty, a specialists in the community affairs area, and they can hold hearings that are not the subject of legislation. This is an important tool that we don't have right now. We can call a hearing on an emergent issue, the farmer's market, uh, the bear cat, the, the kind of thing, these are very strong issues, but uh, on even on issues that are emerging that are not so strong. Uh, again, a committee chair can say, hey, you know, we really should get some input about this. Let's have a, a hearing on I an item that's not the subject of legislation and talk about it. Uh, so I'm not proposing a code change because I think existing code handles it well. I don't want to get rid of the committee of the whole. I think that it's good, for example, for budgets. Unlike other cities that have a budget and finance committee, we're just going to do our budget as a whole. But for other issues, I'd like us to try referring to standing committees. Let's see how it goes. It's not a particularly harmful way to do business. Okay, if I may continue, it still seems that there is some reference to the committee of the whole, um, and I'll continue. Furthermore, should council want to extend deliberations on a matter after it is heard at the committee of the whole, the council can do so by putting the matter to a second, third, fourth, et cetera, reading. Um, if the whole intent is to be more efficient, how is that so? I guess this is my question. The intent isn't to be efficient for the sake of efficiency only. Um, yes, the council may, at second reading, refer back to the committee of the whole, but it never does. It never does. Um, the, um, the concern that some members have about uh, we, us automatically referring to the committee of the whole or to a standing committee is not in evidence here. Um, the, the code only says we have to make a motion first to refer to a standing committee, and if that fails, then we have the option to refer to committee of the whole. In an effort to try standing committee, that's how the land use committee was able to meet over the past couple of years, because we didn't automatically refer to, to stand, committee of the whole, and we weren't forced to get a majority to override our habit. This is about changing our habits, and this allows the default to be a standing committee, but if the council wants to, they can, in fact, a majority vote refer to Committee of the Whole. Okay, thank you. Any more questions from Council? I have one question. Council Member Rosenberg. Uh, my question is, it, it sounds like a lot of this is about time management, and I, I can see the benefit in going both ways here, to have everyone on Council here to comment and ask questions, and I can also see the benefit of having not so many people to really get into the details of legislation. Do you think we can solve time management issues in committee of the whole that we are trying to solve by having standing committees? So can we create 
a committee of the whole where we do have stop times and we make those public. So we, we, we cut off comment, right? And we do all the same things, but we're all here. And so the public would know when to come for a, a, a next issue to come up. Uh, the issue of time management is actually separate from the issue of how we do committees. We should be limiting our time in every circumstance. I love to go back to the example of the night uh, in Committee of the Whole where we addressed the food truck ordinance. Uh, one member of the public got up and spoke for 21 minutes about food trucks. He was a food truck owner. A second owner got up and spoke for 10 minutes. Each of them had about five minutes of material to say. But they took that much time because we had no rule that said that we should limit time. I mean, this is actually a secondary issue. I believe that we need to implement time limits throughout our processes. But uh, keeping the committee of the whole prohibits us from having hearings on items that are not the subject of legislation, which standing committees allow us to do. Um, they, there's, you know, no, uh, it, they allow us to conduct the oversight in a, uh, a reasonable procedure that committee of the whole does not provide. And uh, I, again, I think that when everyone is present, uh, there is more of a pressure among council members, which I've observed many times over my years, uh, to address the issue because they feel like they are here and they need to look like they're, uh, they're involved. It's not a knock on any member. It's not uh, a personality flaw. It's the nature of the beast. When everyone is here, maybe you look like you're not taking part if you don't say anything. And so there's a tendency for more people to say stuff that, you know, and the, and the initial analysis of an issue isn't necessary. The four members who are you and I, there's four of us here on this day, it's not strangers, a complete mystery, that four members uh, can knock out the basic stuff that uh, the, uh, the whole nine doesn't, don't need to worry about. That's the, the value of the committee. I mean, I, I would ask simply again, why does every other city, why does every other legislature use them? There's a reason. Okay, any further questions? Okay, we'll now go to the public for any public comment on resolutions 20-01. Please remember to sign in, state your name, and- Hi, uh, Peter Dorfman. Hi. This is gonna sound a little abstract, um, but I can envision if we have these committees in place, there might be an issue that is of particular concern to a for people in a particular district. And I gather these are small committees, might be four people. It's conceivable that uh, that issue might go before a committee that doesn't include the council member from that district. So uh, my comment is that maybe it would be advisable to set a rule that every uh, uh, committee needs to include one at-large member to kind of represent the, the interests of the rest of the city. Just a thought. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. David Keppel. Um, I think this sounds like a very carefully thought out proposal, and I'm generally enthusiastic about it, but I do have just one thought as a member of the public who often has a very particular ax to grind, uh, and that is, I learn a great deal sitting through the rest of the meeting that I didn't come here for. I think that those of us who are activists, especially perhaps online activists, get a focus that may be very important, may be entirely valid, but we have a responsibility just as much as you have a responsibility, and that is to be aware of the context of the whole business of the city. And I would just, if there are other members of the public listening on cats or something, I would encourage all of us to realize how much you do and how complex the business of the city is. And to take an, to, even when we have a single issue, to take it in the light of the totality of issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Bingham. I just wanted to comment in support of the council committees. Um, 
being having been involved in organizations both cooperative and corporate and everything in between um, trying to handle all issues through a single decision making body gets really overwhelming really fast and at a certain point you have to start breaking it down and chunking it out and taking things a piece at a time um, one of the things as a member of the public I really like about this if I'm understanding it correctly is that where right now you get kind of two shots to comment on a piece of legislation, first reading and second reading, this would give you four, right? The two readings of the committee, then potentially the two readings in three? Okay. You're still getting an additional bite of the apple, basically. Um, it would give us, as a community, a longer period of time to really chew on issues um, while they're working their way through the committees before they come before the whole council. Um, which I think can only benefit us. So I am very much in favor of this. Thank you. Do you have any more comments from the public? We'll return to the council for comments. Council Member Rollo. Thank you. Um, I have a lot of comments, but I'll keep them brief. Um, brevity to this evening. I've already referred to the collective wisdom of all nine members. I, I've served in the council for a long time, and uh, I learn a lot from my colleagues. I learn a lot from the discussion that evolves, and it doesn't just occur at a regular session meeting. It occurs at the committee of the whole, and it allows me time um, to then inquire from staff or petitioner and so forth about specific uh, items that evolve from that discussion. So I appreciate the process as it is now. Um, I'm actually concerned about equity in terms of the ability for people who might be pressed to come to a, a particular meeting, say the, the, the meeting where action is taken, to have two opportunities to speak to all nine council members. Uh, and this would limit it really to only one meeting. Uh, so you would have to, to attend that meeting if you were going to uh, make your case to all nine members. You could do it privately, but it's another thing to stand before the microphone. Um, in terms of, you know, there's two, I guess, two general types of legislation, controversial and non. And the non-controversial uh, tend to go quite quickly. And I think that they can go even, even more quickly if we choose to limit time. Um, the controversial topics uh, are going to probably require, I mean, I would hope they would require a committee of the whole, because I would want there to be that kind of debate, and it might concern, um, you know, well, the interests of everybody, the interests of every district, the interests of, the, uh, of all of the uh, uh, at-large members. Um, there, uh, there's a concern of mine about uh, suppose there are two members absent. You have a four-member committee. You have two absent. Uh, you, you would not have quorum, and therefore that meeting would be canceled. The likelihood of, of um, you know, five members of this body being absent for a meeting would be very unlikely. I don't, I don't think that's ever occurred in the 16-plus years I've been on council. So I'm concerned that meetings might go cancel, be canceled. Um, I think uh, I'm concerned about the administrative burden. I haven't heard from the, the, the administration yet, staff members. I don't know about the eff, eff, efficacy of the land use committee from their point of view. I'd like to hear that perspective um, and former members of the land use committee and so forth about how, how well that went. Um, so I think my general impression is that this is a solution in search of a problem. And I think that if there was a problem specified, it would be that time is, is really the most important factor here. And then pr appropriate scheduling. I think it's a little unfair to compare, um, I say that a typical year was last year. Last year was an exceptional year in terms of the amount of uh, uh, legislative burden that we, that we uh, had to consider. That, that is a very atypical year, and so I would choose a different year in terms of that. So um, th th those are my impressions, and then uh, once I hear from everyone, I, I would like to postpone actually for several re weeks, but I'm open to 
my colleagues in terms of when you would like to bring this up again. Thank you. Any more comments from the council? Council Member Smith. I'm, I'm a new council member, so the, the thing that uh, I have not worked under in either model, or the council of the whole, or the, the uh, standing committees, um, but, but what I wanted to comment was that at, at this point, I don't think I have enough information to make a decision. And so postponing it seems like a very prudent thing to do. And so uh, that, that was the only thing I wanted to comment. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yeah, um, I wanted to uh, respond to a member of the public, um, Mr. Bingham, who said uh, when all of us try to handle all decision-making issues, things become overwhelming very quickly. And I have found that to be true. Um, this is my starting just my third, I'm starting my third term on council, and so I do have experience, but um, it, it does become very difficult to track issues as diverse as uh, bond issuance um, for parks and um, you know whether to require driveway widths to be 18 or 20 feet. I mean, it's just such a wide range of issues that we are responsible for. I would appreciate the opportunity to specialize um, by serving on a limited number of standing committees and really getting to know um, uh, and becoming more expert in certain fields. I think that would uh, serve the public better if we had that opportunity. Um, I also uh, feel like um, the current way we appoint uh, citizens to boards and commissions is somewhat problematic um, in that we don't know a lot about the commissions that we're appointing to. Now, some might say, well, Isabel, you should go to more of their meetings, and um, that would be great if I didn't have a full-time job and other responsibilities in my life, as most of us do. Um, so I, I've never felt fully comfortable in making some of the appointments that I and two of my colleagues make because I don't have as much knowledge about those committees and what they do and what they need. And so this would be another way, um, the standing committee concept would be another way um, to, to become more specialized, to um, you know, talk to those committee chairs and, and uh, become more comfortable with that area uh, in, and then make more responsible appointments, better appointments that, that serve those commissions uh, in a better way. Um, so for those reasons and others, I, I think uh, standing committees are a good idea. Um, I think that necessarily standing committees, um, the, the system of standing committees requires us to trust each other, um, to um, say, I don't have to have my finger in every pot. I can let this group of colleagues um, triage this certain issue and bring out what's important and then bring that back to a full council meeting. Um, I think that having four members uh, will provide enough diversity of opinion and approach and perspective that I'm not too worried about them missing a big point. Um, so I, I think this is a, um, definitely worth trying. Um, I think it's very hard to predict, you know, how this will change things. We've never done things this way. But given that almost every single second class city in the state of Indiana does do things this way, I don't feel like it's too big a risk. Um, there was something else that I wanted to say that I just cannot think of at the moment. Um, I do think that uh, having an additional week is important, um, if only to consult with uh, members of the staff and department heads and make sure there are no um, uh, unintended consequences that they can think of. Um, with this method. Oh yes, the other thing I want to say is that I did serve on the land use committee um, for nearly two years. I've been on that committee and it has worked very efficiently and I have never heard from any colleagues that were not on that committee that we missed something, that we need to revisit something, um, that it somehow didn't work to have that standing committee. 
So um, from that perspective as well, I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Any more council comments? Council Member Scambaluri. Thank you. Um, I share your concern, Council Member Sandberg, Council Member Rollo, and others, uh, about the need for increased staff feedback on this proposal. Um, but some of the comments that were most valuable for me tonight came from Mr. Keppel, Mr. Bingham, and Mr. Dorfman. Thank you um, for weighing in and sharing your thoughts on how this can best work for the public. And for other members of the public, please let us know what you think. Share that feedback with Council Member Volan. Um, or via any of our emails or anything like that. If you're watching on CATS, please consider doing that as well. Um, you are some of the most important voices here. So please let us know what you think. Any further comments? Council Member Volna. It's uh, today's organization day. It's our first meeting of the year. It's where we make decisions about who will lead the council and what appointments are gonna be made. Uh, that's why I think it's appropriate that this be brought up today and not later. It's time to rethink the way that we do business. Um, one offhand, offhand comment I just want to make at the outset is I want to think about who is not here, the people who can never come to these meetings, the people who given up hope they can sit through a whole meeting because they don't know uh, when the issue that they're concerned about will be here. A former member of council once said that people should consider the Committee of the Whole a privilege to learn about the rest of the city. Well, that's the kind of conceit that somebody who has the time to attend council meetings enjoys. But for people who are busy, which is theoretically all of us in this room, uh, but uh, many uh, council members have full-time jobs that they can't, drop, you know, they, they can't drop everything to do everything, that's even more true for the public. So, um, you know, at least in the, the committee system, they'll have at least one chance where they know what time they can testify. Uh, you know, if, if they know there's gonna be an eight o'clock meeting of the uh, Community Affairs Committee and they don't have time to attend the Land Use Committee or at, at 6.30 or the uh, Public Safety Committee at 9.45, at least they know the start of the end time and they will have one chance to have input into the issue that's really concerning to them. Um, but I've heard a, a lot of unheard of hypo hypotheticals. For example, Councilman Barallo saying that uh, if two members are absent, what happens? Well, let's just point this out. Any, because of the rule for serial scheduling, any member of council can treat committee night as though it were committee of the whole. They are free to attend all night. It would have taken the same amount of time the committee of the whole would have taken with maybe 15 minute gaps in between committee hearings. So the whole point is to make sure that if somebody does want to attend every committee meeting, even if they don't get to sit at the dais, they can be there and hear all the input and testimony. And members of the public can know that they're there. But in two years of the Land Use Committee, Councilmember Granger was the only member not on the committee who came, and she came a couple times on a particular issue. It gave the other five members the night off, or at least a period of time off. Uh, it shows, e you know, even if, uh, uh, you know, the idea that some other committee of the whole is better because everybody's there, it does show that council members enjoy uh, not having to be here for a meeting. And that, uh, you know, I didn't hear any complaints, as Councilmember Piedmont Smith said. Um, the administrative burden. Uh, again, i first point out, I hope that the non-members of the LUC enjoyed their nights off. Secondly, um, you know, there's uh, time to put together a report it doesn't have to be long, it should be one page or less, that just summarizes what was discussed at committee. Committees are not meant for pontification, they're meant for triage. Um, uh, the, let's see what I have here. Um, I just think that uh, postponing beyond next week is a delay tactic. Consider that an ordinance introduced tonight that has a committee of the whole tonight, because we doubled that up because of the beginning of the year will get uh, you know, a second reading one week after the Committee of the Whole, okay? Uh, by postponing to next week, you're giving this legislation as much time as any regular ordinance. We've done this many, many times in the past. I, I, I think that postponing to any time later than next week is simply uh, saying I don't agree with it, I'm, I'm trying to delay it. There is no member of the administration here to address this issue. Uh, but when I've spoken to members of the administration, uh, when it comes to how committees are scheduled, uh, they have no complaints. They certainly have no complaints about time limits. 
Um, I think there's a certain bias of those of us who can come or who are paid to come to these meetings. Um, it's easy for us to say, well, we're having a public meeting, they can just show up, but we're not, are, how hard are we trying to really engage members of the public? This is a method that allows that. Um, the idea about somehow including the district representative uh, for an issue affecting their district. I want to encourage the district representative to come to a committee meeting if they're not already on the committee. But again, we schedule them serially so that every member can attend. Uh, and we're always going to have this issue, uh, what uh, the, the exhortation of us to trust each other is one I will echo. Trust us, we are your colleagues. We have done a lot together. We will do a lot together. We're going to depend on each other to get through all these issues together. This is a way of allowing us to specialize while giving us a little bit more time to, to specialize uh, and take time off and deliberate. It allows us to spread across the calendar issues that are controversial. Um, that uh, the collective wisdom is available at regular session. We can always go to a third reading if necessary. Many cities do it. There's no reason why we can't, but the committee is more likely to, to reduce the need for third readings because most of the time the council is going to find that they are satisfied with the work of their four colleagues. Um, you know, the, uh, I've said most everything else. I think that uh, we're a growing city. Uh, we can't keep this up. There's too much work on the agenda. This is necessary. I would uh, urge you to support this. If there's going to be a postponement, I urge that you postpone to January 15th. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Uh, yeah, I'm inclined to support this uh, as well. I would also support postponing it uh, one week uh, to learn more and hear more from staff. Uh, I echo some of the benefits that, that Council Member Piedmont Smith did. A few others uh, that I find attractive are of course, the public and staff benefit of knowing what time various issues will be held. I've sat through a lot of long meetings as a member of the public. Uh, if you knew when certain issues were coming up, uh, as somebody who has uh, been juggling multiple demands, I, I would have found that very uh, useful. And in that way, uh, perhaps more equitable because people know when to show up and don't need to feel like they need to show up for multiple meetings on multiple nights uh, just to make sure they get their word in. In fact, that happened during the UDO hearings. Uh, people gathered to People had come to a meeting to speak on one of the more controversial elements of that, and uh, it didn't get heard that night. The meeting ended, and it was continued into the next night, and people uh, weren't able to come back who wanted to speak on that issue. They had one night they were able to make it, uh, and because it went over time, they were not able to share their comment. Um, I agree that specialization uh, uh, in both appointments to boards and commissions, as well as specialization in subject matter, uh, will benefit council uh, and the public. Uh, and how we approach those committees, or commissions and boards. Um, and the other, the other thing I really like is uh, this investigate other areas within their jurisdiction. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of the mayor's recent proposals on Inauguration Day about um, a green ribbon panel to consider um, climate issues and, and climate mitigation and adaptation in the city, as well as uh, climate justice initiatives. Uh, thinking of the local climate activist uh, groups that have gotten uh, going in the last year or so, I think that would the Sustainability, Climate Action, and Resilience um, Committee would be a great um, body to interface with that group and, and collectively work towards solutions. Uh, it's a mechanism we haven't really had to date, or it's been very unwieldy, if, 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 it's, uh, if I understand how it's previously been done uh, correctly. Uh, so I think there are, there are benefits that, that, that aren't really, and tools that aren't really um, uh, accessible to us in the current system of going committee of the whole for almost everything. Uh, I think inevitably this is going to be a little bit iterative. Uh, there will be, you know, some kinks worked out. Uh, that's that's okay. Uh, and if at any time on any legislative matter, five members of this council can refer it to committee of the whole and skip, instead skip the standing committee, uh, and that to me is a failsafe that that makes it really makes the cell um, because there's just no real risk here. If it's not working, you just don't use it. Um, or use it only for the investigative purpose, or only for uh, appointments to committees. Um, finally, I'll just note that this is not duplicative. Uh, it is a parallel alternative path to uh, getting to um, sec second regular session and second, second reading. Uh, so I've just heard that a time or two. I want to make sure that we're all clear that this is picking a different path that is not creating um, additional layers of work. Um, but again, I support postponing a week to um, hear more. Thanks.
further council comments. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. I have been a member of this council since 2007, and in my initial year on this council, I had a lot to learn. And it took probably the entire first term before I felt comfortable even expressing a voice. I learned so much from the experienced council people, from the staff that I was just getting acquainted with and getting familiar with their work and who to go to when you had questions. And I see that we are two separate branches, as many governing bodies are. We have an executive branch who's responsible for a lot of administrative tasks, and we have the legislative branch. And I think we're getting very dangerously close to overreaching and overstepping some of our boundaries here. I am not in favor of the standing committee system. I am in favor if there are problems with constituents not finding our meetings uh, accessible or usable, absolutely let's work on the reforms to work on the workload management. And that can be done by having a good working relationship with the administration. Uh, that can be done by having discipline amongst ourselves to not go on and on and on and quamate and lecture, but to listen carefully, to ask good questions, to get clarity, and then do our job, which is to vote, right? Our job is to vote things up or down when it comes to the final regular sessions. What we as council members need to do in the interim to study the issues, understand what's going on, who do we need to contact if we have questions, that we do on our own time. Um, uh, to be prepared to make logical, educated, good decisions about the working of this city, what our staff does, how they interact, and then what we ourselves do with respect to policy and legislation. Um, for the record, this is not the first time we've heard this proposal. It's the third time I have heard it. I'm still not convinced it's the right way to go, uh, based on my experience working with the Committee of the Whole. I have always approached my position on the council that I am elected at large, and I am one of nine. And when we start becoming specialists, as opposed to what I consider my role up here to be a generalist, which is to understand all the inner workings of all the legislation that comes here, I see us dividing up into subcommittees. And when people say to me, but oh, other cities do it, frankly, I don't care. I want to make sure that we are operating in the best fashion we can for the public that we are responsible to here in the city of Bloomington. So again, I have major concerns. I will voice them later. I am absolutely in favor of postponement because I think we have given short shrift to our administration and our staff. I think this is a little bit on the um, dismissive side to say it's our privilege as council to manage our own business but we don't do this in a vacuum. We need to have good working relationships with our mayor and with his department heads and our staff in order to do the work we need to do up here and do it responsibly, do it democratically, small d, and make sure that we are, all of us, all nine of us, serving the public in all aspects of the inner workings of this body. I would respectfully also ask that those of, that are just joining this, this uh, august body, there is a learning curve. I'm still learning, and this is the start of my fourth term. And so when we start thinking that we're going to serve each other and the public well by becoming specialists, before we do tap into the institutional knowledge of all nine of us up here, where we have the benefit of doing that in the committee of the whole, I think it does a disservice to our community and to our constituents. I have fairly strong opinions about it. Again, I will uh, be more organized in my thoughts for the next time this is discussed. But but I am not in favor of changing the committee of the whole structure uh, to standing committees in the first week of the first year of a new term. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Barallo. Um, yeah, I, I don't regard this as an ordinary legislative item. I think it, because it's a significant change in process, uh, it ought to be given appropriate time. Uh, for questions to evolve and be answered, and we've yet to hear from the administration. Um, and if it, we proceed on this, it ought to be done right. Um, it affects not only council, but administration staff, the public, various petitioners, and so forth. So I will move that we 
uh, postpone this item until our regular session of the 29th of January to allow adequate time, since I don't think that all of our questions will be answered within a week. They're still in. There, there's, still, um, there's still debate. There's still comments that council colleagues would like to make before we um, vote on the motion that has been made. So I would like to go back and make sure we have all comments before we proceed with the motion that Council Member Rollo made. Council Member Rosenbarger, did you have a comment? I do, thank you. So as a new member of council, along with three others up here, we have the most recent experience as being someone sitting on the other side and spending our night sometimes to a week waiting to make a public comment. It, with the UDL, it really wasn't rare that we would be here for five hours and potentially not get to comment until the next night if we had time to come back. So I think for me, one of the biggest one of the biggest benefits of standing committees is that we will have a more predictable schedule for people to come and comment and engage with us on the issues. I think it is an equity problem that Committee of the Whole doesn't give a, a timeline for when your issue might come up. So, you know, you have people here for two hours but might have to go pick kids up after after a school event or right, go home to make dinner for the kiddos. And so this would really help people who don't really get a chance to sit here for five hours to come when they know, when they know something relevant is happening for them. I, I really do like the, many people up here have spoken to this, but the ability to specialize and dig deep into the issues. I think something we haven't been able to do with Committee of the Whole is hold legislative hearings. And I think that's something we could really look into with standing committees because, I mean, try as we might, it's very difficult to get really diverse voices in our audience. And I think allowing uh, deeper dives and uh, experts to come in, uh, comment, and we can question them, I think that will really help get, get voices and perspectives in the room that we might not have the chance to do at Committee of the Whole. So for that and other reasons, I lean toward supporting this. Is there any further comments? Okay, I'll take one. Looks like I got back just in time. Um, first of all, I want to thank, um, obviously, Council Member Volan has put a lot of work and thought into this. Um, in part of the presentation, and again, I hope this is just my open public thoughts, I heard an awful lot of I, 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 and I'm not as comfortable as I would be hearing more we. And I think part of the issue here, or why we're having such discussions, is that we just haven't really had enough time to, to digest some of this, what we're hearing. Um, so I, I am looking forward to postponing so we can have further discussion. Um, I really want to hear more how this is going to impact staff. Um, I even want to hear from administration. I know it's our call and it, it affects us. We've heard a lot how it affects the public. I'm still wanting to hear more about how it affects us or how it doesn't affect us. Um, part of that clarity, I'm kind of, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, I'm personally wondering where does the rules committee go and what happens there when it goes into a, an, an alleged committee and what about some of the progress that we've already made there? And I, and I think that's a very important as we move forward. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing more about that. Um, a couple final comments. One of the things I heard that we're here because we're paid. Um, I think that's pretty clear, it's part of the budget, but I'm telling you, I'm here and I hope I can speak, I think I do speak for the majority of my colleagues. We are here because we were elected. So I think we just, again, I, know, I don't think there was any negativity meant there, but I think words matter. We just kind of got to be careful how we present some things. Um, another example, and again, I'm not intending to chastise. That's not what I'm doing. I'm going into 2020 um, with clearer vision. I just want to be more collaborative and, and fair-minded. But one of the comments was earlier is that, some of the council members would ask, in committee of the whole, would ask questions to not appear to be disengaged. And I don't know how that is quantified, how that can be supported, and that, in my mind, assumes that some of those comments 
lends itself to being irrelevant. It, it, that people just want to talk to be heard, basically, and I disagree with that. Um, it may not be timely, it may not be what we want to hear, but I think most people up here on this dais, when they have something to say, it is at least relevant to them, if not for anything else other than for clarity's sake. Um, lastly, um, there's been a couple uses or requests to trust, trust. Words matter. One of the things that I want to be able to do and I feel I can is depend on my colleagues to do their job and to serve on the committees that they're on. I believe I can depend on them. I'm not so sure, and again, this is just me, that if trust is one of the words I want to use as part of um, what we do as legislatures as far as standing committees betwixt and all of us. So that's the end of my comments. Do we have any more council? I need to talk to the parliamentarian. No, all right, okay, is that relevant? Is, um, has council member Volan already had two chances? Or just one? I, I, I think so. Yeah. I think yeah. there's a couple that's had two, I think. So, um, Two is fine, more than two is not acceptable. So if he hasn't had two, then. I, I, I'm right down, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep track here, but uh, there's only one that I know. Yes. Thank you. Uh, just to respond to some of the comments that I've heard, um, uh, in particular, uh, I would challenge at least Councilman Rollo to consider how often we have said in regular session, well, I said everything I was going to say about this last week in Committee of the Whole. It happens so often that it's a thing. Um, the, he, the, the, the standing committee system does not preclude members from having their full say. It just makes sure that that full say is had in regular session uh, when minutes are being kept and the discussion can still happen. Uh, so if uh, we say, if, if all we do in regular session is say, well, I said it all last week, then why have regular session? Um, you know, this is a way of cutting down on that kind of comment as well as cutting down on the amount of time that we spend deliberating on things that don't require that much time or th that many uh, cooks. Um, but uh, the idea that um, uh, we need to discipline ourselves um, you know, I am the first one to admit that without a timer, I will go on longer. And we should absolutely be using timers. That when, in Lanny's committee, several of us who were notorious for speaking at length, uh, setting a timer to four minutes gets people to stop. We canceled three meetings of the UDO that we expected we needed because we used timers. So if nothing else, I think we should be thinking about using timers on a more regular basis. Uh, otherwise, this debate would have been different and shorter. Um, but uh, this has been proposed by me more than once uh, in, this, in the way that Councilmember Flaherty points out, it's iterative, it's taken time to develop what will work, but the, the idea that somehow this is not the time to do it, we need more time to study it, we need to get input from everybody else, this is a delay tactic. This is meant to say we don't really want this. Um, this is getting as much time as any, as any ordinance. Uh, we've, had, we've passed much bigger issues with uh, much less uh, effort, with a much more compact uh, way. The idea that somehow that uh, we as council are somehow, um, I mean, I, it's, I, I think that the opposition to this is very passive towards the administration. And the legislation, at, at the statute and city code clearly says we are co-equal branches of government. And we don't have to be uh, throwing our weight around to say we'd like to more concretely decide how we're going to provide oversight of the administration because that is our, our duty by city code. It is our duty by statute. And this is the mechanism for doing it. So, uh, you know, I'm tired of hearing the state it's never time to discuss this. We need more time to think about it. The time is now. The time is now. The time is this month. Let's get this done by next week. I'm happy to answer questions, hear what the administration has to say on Friday, but I think the fact that they're not here, there's plenty of other issues that are more burning for them right now, and this is reasonable. This is common 
This is natural. This is the way that legislatures do business. They divide the work up. Let's try it. Please, let's just try it. Trust it. Thank you. The council comment has been exhausted. Council Member Voland, were you going to offer a motion? I'm sorry, no. Rollo. There, there was already, there, there, there is a motion. motion. On the table. Yeah. Motion. Okay. And it's been seconded. Um, Council Member Rollo, I'm sorry. It, may I ask you to repeat to what date you want to table it? Yes, the, the regular session of the 29th of January. Point of order. No. Is there a regular session scheduled for that day? No. You have to be, you would be calling one by your motion. It's the fifth uh, point of information, uh, uh, I, we have scheduled a council work session for Friday. We do have some other business. Uh, it was my understanding that it, this was another topic to come up on that uh, meeting now. So I just you might want to announce if that's your intention that you will take it up on Friday. It's a council work session. But uh, the next time it will come formally to the council if this motion to pass would be the 29th. Call the question on the motion. I th oh, I'd like to comment on it. I don't think it's, Mr. Vice President. Doesn't it end debate? Uh, yes, it's subject to limited debate. You, you, typically it's the date. You know, uh, yeah. is that does that work with what you have in mind? Yes, I like to say that uh, again. We're uh, the the motion proposes a meeting we haven't scheduled. Uh, I'm, I'm suggesting that it be uh, moved like any other piece of legislation to the next regular session, which is coming up next week. Uh, if those who oppose this legislation would like to demonstrate some, uh, uh, some examples of how this would be, uh, like they need data to gather, I would you know, like to know what that data might be, but I find it to be objectionable, and I think that the 15th is a more appropriate date and perfectly fine, so I oppose the motion. Any further? Yes, Council Member Flaherty. I'll, I'll just agree that I think the 15th is appropriate. Uh, we don't have a session scheduled on the 29th. I don't see any reason why. Uh, if, you're, if you're against it and just want to vote against it next week, that's of course okay, but I don't see a reason why we can't uh, hear what we need to hear and decide next week. Okay, are there any form, further comments? Just okay, I do believe. Uh, you may be... Uh, uh, referring a, a matter later on this evening to a land use committee and the 29th. You might be splitting your duties on the 29th between two uh, items, just to let you know that. Call the question. Uh, second. Okay. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Rosenbarger. Yeah. Pardon yeah. me, pardon me. This is the motion to postpone for until January 29th. <coughs> that correct? Okay. Just wanted to be clear, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh. No. Sims? Yes. Volan? No. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? No. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Scambleri? Yes. Motion passes 6 3. Motion passes 6 3. I'm sorry, I thought the clerk was going to tell us that. Thank you. Right, with Thank that, you. The, uh, you got your gavel back. Yeah, okay. the, Thank the you. The issue is resolved. We will postpone to the meet to a meeting to be scheduled for January 29th. With that, we now go to legislation for first reading. Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 2001, the um, read, introduced and read by title and synopsis only. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2001 to amend the City of Bloomington zoning maps by 
rezoning a 3.2 acre property from commercial limited to a planned unit development and to approve a district ordinance and preliminary plan regarding 105 South P. Ellis Drive, Curry Urban Properties Petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. Ordinance 2001 would rezone a 3.2 acre property from commercial limited to a planned unit development and approve a PUD district ordinance and preliminary plan to allow the construction of a mixed use building. Mr. President, I move that the council refer ordinance 2001 for discussion at the land use committee on Wednesday, January 15th to start no earlier than 8 p.m. And Wednesday, January 29th um, to start. Just refer to land use committee. That's, that's oh, I'm, I'm reading from the, uh, the proposed motion that um, council attorney Shirt Sherman wrote for us. Do we have to specify the dates? Uh, the date, yes. You don't. You can um, leave the time open. Uh, you can have the committee next week decide when they'll meet on the the um, the 29th. So. Okay. So um, to meet January 15th, starting no earlier than 8 p.m., and then on Wednesday, January 29th, to start at a time to be determined later. Is Thanks. there a, thank you. Motion a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The, the uh, ordinance will be referred to the Land Use Committee to meet on January 15th. Further? Mr. President, I move that ordinance 2002 be read by title and synopsis only. Second. Introduced and read? Introduced and read? First reading? Introduced and read by title. Sorry, I'm new here. In this chair. We're going to hear that for a while. The, the motion should be, it'd be, it'd be introduced and read by title and synopsis only. Second. Am I correct, so Mr. Sherman? Thank you. you. Need a second. You need a second. I'm sorry, I'm new to it. All in favor, <laughs> all in favor <laughs> say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. <laughs> Will the clerk please read? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ordinance 2002. Final approval to issue economic development notes and lend the proceeds for the renovation of affordable housing. Um, RA Walnut Woods, 818 East Miller Drive and Reverend Butler Apartments, 1202 West 11th Street, Bloomington, RAD, ILP Petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. Ordinance 2002 authorizes the City of Bloomington to issue up to 11 million in aggregate principal amount of its City of Bloomington, Indiana Economic Development Revenue Note Series 2020A Walnut Woods Reverend Butler Project and its City of Bloomington, Indiana Economic Development Revenue Note Series 2020B Walnut Woods Reverend Butler Project collectively the notes in one or more series and approving and authorizing other actions in respect thereto. Thank you. Uh, before we go to additional public comment, I would like to also uh, entertain a motion to um, appoint Dan Sherman as our attorney for the year 2020. Second. Is there such a motion? I, need oh, a mo I, I move that Dan Sherman be appointed the council attorney slash administrator for 2020. Need a second. 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 Motion is second. Um, uh, unless there's objection, we'll, we can do this by voice vote, I think. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it, Mr. Sherman. Thank you for your service and uh, into the year 2020. With that, we go to additional public comment. 25 minutes set aside for comment not on, on items not on the agenda. Please come to the uh, podium and uh, state your name. And we have a taker, a former employee of the city council. Sign in after you speak, please. So as a former employee of the State city council, name, oh, Melissa O'Neill, um, I should have known that I can't comment on uh, first reading. Uh, I was going to make some comments on 2001. Um, I know how quickly the legislation moves, um, so I was afraid I would lose my chance. Um, so instead, I will make some just general comments um, that I've sort of um, want to make. Uh, so. I know there's a strong um, 
feelings. I don't know. That's, that's, okay, anyways. So sustainability is a very common and strong uh, movement at the moment, um, and I want to ask council to reconsider the 40-foot height um, restrictions on buildings. Um, I find that by increasing the density, um, it would allow uh, more growth in Bloomington without the loss of green space. Um, it's also um, more efficient in a lot of ways. Um, another thing um, is at the beginning of the meeting, um, Council Member Rollo mentioned that Bloomington is 80,000 strong in people. Um, I also want, I want to make note that half of that is students um, and to address that the students are a part of this community and that they come from other communities uh, that can feed into how we shape the city um, would be good. Um, I guess that's it. Thanks. Hi. My name is Daniel Bingham. Uh, I wanted to comment on the mayor's proposal that he made in his inauguration day speech for a 0.5% increase in the LIT to create a sustainability fund. Um, the mayor didn't propose what that money should be used for. He just said, let's do a 0.5% increase and it'll go towards sustainability. The local income tax is a regressive tax by nature. It's a flat tax. We can't make it progressive. We can't do income brackets. So it's really, really important that if we do this, the money that is raised goes towards helping low-income and marginalized people because they are going to feel the sting of that tax much more deeply than middle and high-income people. Um, so I think it's really important that we start talking about, all right, if we raise the tax, what do we do with it? And I had begun, just as a, an activist, exploring, I've been exploring all year what we can do for sustainability and trying to find funding and I agree that we probably need to go to the LIT, although I think there's more exploration that can be done, and that if we're gonna turn to a regressive tax, we owe it to the community to explore every possible avenue. So I think we need to spend some more time looking at the budget to see if there's anything that could be cut, but I do think it's likely we will need to raise funds for sustainability initiatives. What I would like to propose, and just throw out an idea to throw out there for people to start chewing on, um, if we do raise the LIT, let's go the full 1.25% that we have available to us. That would get us 20 million instead of 8 million. Put 10 million of that into the transit system. That doubles the transit system's budget. We can make it fare free. We can add Saturday and Sunday service. We can potentially double or quadruple the number of buses so that you have them coming every half an hour or every 15 minutes. We can add additional routes. We can make it a usable transit system. Right now, bus fares for a year are about $300. I think there are some grants and scholarships, but just for an annual bus pass is 300 bucks. For somebody making 20,000 a year, I believe a 1.25% increase in the LIT would amount to about $250 out of their pocket annually. So if we can create a bus system they can use, and it's free, and they don't have to pay the bus fares, that saves them 300 bucks, they're paying 250, they're getting 50 back. If we can save them from buying a car, if we can let them get rid of one of their cars. The federal government estimates the average annual cost of car ownership at around $9,000 a year per car. I think people, a lot of low-income people are able to do that more cheaply, but if you add gas, you add insurance, you add the cost of paying for the car, it's at least a couple of thousand. So if we can build a bus system with the LIT that enables people to ditch a car, they'll be saving thousands of dollars. So they'll be out 250 and getting back thousands. With the remaining, that, that's the first 10 million. With the remaining 10 million, I would propose put 5 million into the housing fund. We need to build more housing. There are 30,000 people who commute into this city every day. 30,000. We are building maybe 500 units of housing a year. Most of that is not affordable. Part of the reason those people commute into the city is because they can't afford to live in the city. So we need to build a lot more affordable housing. I don't know what the numbers are off the top of my head of how much we put into the housing fund, but I know having worked in housing, having been on the board of Bloomington Cooperative Living, I know that $5 million a year would go a long way 
in the nonprofit housing sector. And if we, if we funnel that specifically into nonprofit housing, then it will be permanently affordable. It will build capacity in organizations that will continue to work independent of the city and independent of city funds. Because, you know, at Bloomington Cooperative Living, we, we managed to maintain a high degree of affordability, but we did take in development funds that then we would, would use to build more housing. And the more housing that we'd managed, the more we took in as development funds that we could build more housing. It's a growing effect. For the remainder of five million, I would propose a solar program, um, a solar loan program and grant program to expa vastly expand uh, Indiana Solar for All. If 2.5 million would be 125 solar systems a year. We need to install a billion dollars worth of solar just to cover Bloomington's emissions, to, to hit the cuts we need to make by 2030. Obviously, we can't hit that on our own, but if we start aggressively supporting solar installs, we can put pressure on Duke to do their own conversion from coal and gas towards solar, because they don't want to lose the customers, and every solar system that goes on a roof is a, is a customer lost for them. And then the remaining 2.5 million, I would say, put into weatherization, because there are massive gains on efficiency, on emissions reduction through weatherization, and it's really beneficial to low-income people. Thank you. Any further public comment? Seeing none, we'll go to issues of council schedule. Our attorney is out of the room. Uh, we certainly uh, have a, do, do you know anything about the schedule, Mr. Lucas? No, I'll just remind the council that there is a work session scheduled for this Friday at 1.15 p.m., which is a little different than our normal noon time. It's in the McCloskey room in anticipation of uh, larger crowd than normal, so. And the uh, 115 time is because our four new members are going to be on noon edition on WFIU at noon on Friday, so this meeting was scheduled to accommodate uh, their ability to attend. Uh, we hope that, that it will help them. Mr. President, I believe we need to formally move to hold this work session since it wasn't on our schedule. I will enter entertain such a motion. I move to hold a work session at 115 on Friday. Needs a second. Motion and a second. All in favor of holding a work session this Friday at 1.15 p.m., please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Do you uh, want to, uh, often we have a show of hands to see who will actually attend. I don't know if that's How many people <laughs> uh, will, are planning to attend the work session at 1.15 on Friday? We have at least five. So it looks like we'll, if it's more than three, we usually hold it. So, uh, okay. Uh, any other schedule? Issues, Mr. Sherman? Nothing new given the actions you've already taken tonight, so. Thank you. With that, uh, we are about to adjourn, followed immediately by Committee of the Whole to take up Ordinance 2002. We will reconvene in about two minutes so that we can change seats. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Uh, motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. I will call to order this Committee of the Whole meeting for Wednesday, January 8th, 2020. Um, we have one item on our agenda. It's Ordinance 2002, final approval to issue economic development notes and lend the proceeds for the renovation of affordable housing. Regarding Walnut Woods, 818 East Miller Drive and Reverend Butler Apartments, 1202 West 11th Street. And we have Mr. Larry Allen from uh, the legal department to present tonight. Member, for the sake of brevity and just for the sake of the expertise, uh, Tyler Kalachnik, who is uh, from Ice Miller, who is representing the uh, ultimate uh, developer, is going to give you the presentation for this, but I am here, obviously, to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Kalachnik. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman, members of the council. Um, as noted, I'm Tyler Kalachnik, partner with Ice Miller, uh, serving as bond counsel for this transaction. <clears throat> Just a real brief background, because I know uh, congratulations are in order to some of the new members and also the elected uh, positions. But um, this is a conduit, commonly referred to as a conduit bond issue, uh, which essentially means that the city, by issuing the bonds, takes on no uh, financial obligation with respect to the bonds, uh, because it's payable solely from project revenues. Um, uh, no effect on constitutional debt limit, uh, not payable from taxes or funds of the city. Um, <clears throat> so by way of background too, um, the, the conduit issuance does two things. One, uh, 
the reason the developer and, and Bloomington Housing Authority are before you is because uh, only governmental entities can issue tax exempt bonds and that does two things. It provides access to capital markets at a lower interest rate and particularly for uh, affordable housing projects provides the ability to um, capture 4% low income housing tax credits from the federal government. So um, in terms of the timeline of approvals that have occurred here, we were before the Economic Development Commission uh, beginning August of 2019. Uh, then this council induced the, resolu uh, induced the project uh, September 2019, that's essentially acts as a preliminary uh, step in, in the bond issuance and also allows for application to the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority, which is the tax allocation agency in the state. Uh, and then <clears throat> most recently with the uh, Economic Development Commission, uh, which they saw the documents and the ordinance that's before you this evening in December of 2019. Uh, at that time, too, a public hearing was held, uh, no comments from the public, and I, the EDC approved everything unanimously. Uh, and then finally, <clears throat> before last time we were before this body, um, the structure of the bonds and uh, notes, as, as they're referred to, um, in your ordinance uh, was not known, but it's going to be a, very similar to a transaction that was before you last year um, for Canterbury, um, with, which Herm Herman and Kittle was the developer there. It's a private placement, meaning uh, a bank, in this case BMO Harris, will be purchasing the bonds, um, estimated to have a, a March-April closing date. And then uh, following that, the construction period, I believe, uh, will conclude in fall of 2021 for the rehabilitation uh, of units in, in these two properties. And if there's specific questions on the project, uh, Amber Scobie, the executive director of Bloomington Housing Authority, is here tonight as well. Does that uh, conclude your presentation? It does. Please okay. ask any questions if you Thank like. Thank you. Um, are there any uh, questions from council members? Well, I don't see any. So we'll go to the public. Is there any member of the public who would like to comment on this ordinance? All right, we'll come back to council for comment from council members. Does any council member want to make a comment? Yes, council member Volum. I hope that all eight people here, the community of the whole, enjoyed this presentation. I'm sorry that you had to wait so long to make this presentation. This is the way our schedule works. We appreciate the presentation. Thank you. We appreciate your time. <laughs> and I'll just add that um, I'm very excited about this project. I'm glad um, the BHA has the opportunity to uh, rehabilitate these apartments. Um, of course, um, uh, Walnut Woods is in District 5, so I'm excited to see uh, progress on those units in particular. But um, I am pleased uh, to approve this. I think, you know, this is sort of a, a pass through as um, Mr. Kalachnik said, and um, it's just uh, a way that the city can help to um, facilitate uh, this funding without assuming any risk the, for, through the city itself. So it's, it's a win-win in my, in my view. Um, if there are no further comments, uh, Council Member Samber. Oh, Council Member Sims. Thank you. Um, I just want to say one of the uh, and we've heard this before in different versions and all the way back in Canterbury, but one thing that I'm very, very happy about is that we won't be displacing the residents during this project. Um, I think that's very, very important, and I thought it was somewhat creative on, on and, and maybe it was Ms. Scobie that, or the board, that came up with that so that we could avoid that. So um, I just want to say that's one of the things that I'm most pleased with um, in addition to the rest of this project, so thank you. Move do pass. Second. Second. All right. I'll start on my right, and this is just an opportunity to say yes or no, uh, yes or no and it's a straw poll. So just for the review of new members, we're just going to go right down the line. So Council Member Scavalleri, you want to yes. start? Yes. 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 All right. That's a do pass recommendation of eight to zero. Uh, Attorney Sherman, did you yes. have a 
Do you have a, a need to have the bond council here next week uh, to answer questions? Or can uh, Ms. Scobie be available? How, any, any preferences on those matters? It would appear that nobody had questions, so Council Member Volan, as Council President, what do you think? I would say no. I, I, we appreciate their attendance tonight, and we're sorry that they had to stay so long for, for it. But we don't think there's going to be a need next week. No. My, it's my opinion. Would Mr. Allen be available? Mr. Allen, would you be here? Yes. Okay. Very good. I think that'll be fine, then, without the Bond Council. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That concludes our business for Committee of the Whole. Thank you very much. We are now adjourned. <laughs>